Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure. How are you all? So in this video, we will see, what if Naruto awaken with the power of Dark Dragon. Here is short summary. Naruto is on a mission with Team 7, however on the mission they encounter a force which had long since been forgotten, the Great and Dark Dragon, Alduin, and Naruto awakens a great power. With the aid of a secret group he masters his new powers. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time. Let's begin the story. Naruto looked ahead at his sensei, Kakashi Hitaki and sighed as he was bored out of his mind. Kakashi looked back and sighed as well. He was also just as bored with this assignment that Team 7 had been assigned, watching an ancient ruin that was recently discovered so that the archaeologists could safely excavate without having to worry about bandits attacking them. Naruto looked over at Sakura and rolled his eyes when he saw her staring, not at the ruins like she was supposed to but at the Ima wonder, Sasuke Uchiha. Naruto only pretended to like Sakura so that he could hide the fact that he could look at all the girls without raising suspicion and find a girl he really liked. He knew about Hanada, heiress to the Hyuga clan, but knew that her father would never allow her to be with him so he chose not to be with her, no matter how much she wanted to be with him. It was for her own safety since he knew of the Hyuga clan's two families and their seals. He didn't want her to be thrown aside and branded by the seal so he kept his distance and kept up his clueless act. Naruto looked at Kakashi. Hey Kakashi-sensei, how long is this going to take? I'm dying of boredom over here. Kakashi sighed. I don't know Naruto, and honestly, I'm bored also but we have to remain vigilant, you never know when the dig crew down there might come under attack. Naruto nodded and picked up a rock and threw it in the direction of the pink-haired girl. Of course Naruto's aim was perfect and it hit directly in the center of her enormous forehead and bounce off, hitting Sasuke in the side of the head. Kakashi saw this and chuckled, whispering, good aim, to Naruto, making him chuckle in response as Sasuke looked at Sakura in anger while she looked at Naruto in anger and Naruto pointed at the excavation site. Hey you two. Kakashi-sensei said we have to focus, we might be attacked at any minute. As if to prove him right three bandits suddenly appeared and Kakashi gave the signal for the team to attack. Naruto, Kakashi, Sakura and Sasuke jumped out and began to fight the bandits. However the bandits were weak and were easily taken care of within a minute and Sasuke stood beside one and scoffed, please. These weaklings were pathetic, but that's to be expected, I am an Uchiha, the never stood a chance. Sakura shouted her agreement and screeched out that, her Sasuke, was the best ninja in the world. Kakashi, Naruto, and the archaeologists who were hiding during the fight all sweat dropped while Kakashi and Naruto shook their heads at the same time, both annoyed at both of their attitudes and antics. The archaeologists went back to work when suddenly Naruto felt a pull in his and looked in the direction of the ruins. What's this feeling? Why do I suddenly feel like I need to go over there? Naruto's body started moving with his eyes distant as if he was deep in thought. Kakashi noticed this and grabbed Naruto's shoulder. Hey, you alright Naruto? Naruto looked back at Kakashi. I don't know, I just feel an urge to head over there, but I don't know why. Naruto pointed to a part that was open in a wall that formed a half circle and had a carving of what appeared to be a strange face or possibly a claw or perhaps a mix of both. A. N. I can't really describe what that symbol is where the words of power are located, it kind of reminds me of those giant scorpions heads from the movie Clash of the Titans. The wall had strange writing that the archaeologists were trying to decipher. Kakashi looked confused and decided to see what happened, so he motioned the rest of Team 7 to follow Naruto. Sasuke and Sakura had heard what Naruto said and Sasuke smirked thinking he wanted to go over there and cry at being a failure of a ninja while Sakura was thinking he wanted to try to prove he was smarter than Sasuke, but she believed that Naruto never would be but decided to follow him since Sasuke was as well. Naruto looked at one section of the wall and Kakashi gasped as Naruto's eyes began to go out of focus as Naruto walked forward. From Naruto's point of view, Naruto saw a few symbols begin to glow and everything else faded from view in darkness and he felt his body walk forward on its own as he heard chanting coming from the symbols as well as from the very air around him getting louder the closer he got. When he was halfway there, the symbols suddenly released what appeared to be a visible breeze that surrounded in him and he stopped moving as the symbols then formed a word, force. Regular point of view, Kakashi saw Naruto's eyes come back into focus and he ran up to a particular group of symbols and stared at them in shock and mumbled, force. 
This means force, but how can I know that? Several archaeologists were listening and were confused but they heard his confusion and they thought if he did truly understand then he might be able to translate the rest of the text but before they could ask Kakashi stepped forward, Naruto, what are you mumbling about? Naruto looked at Kakashi, I understand this one word, but I don't know how I can understand it. Kakashi looked surprised, what does it say? Naruto looked at the word again and then back at Kakashi. It says force. Sasuke laughed, oh please like a loser like you could understand any of this gibberish. Sakura nodded, smirking at Naruto. Sasuke's right, there's no way Naruto Baka could understand that nonsense. Kakashi looked at Naruto, who was not paying attention to the others as Sasuke and Sakura started ranting on about how Sasuke and the Uchiha clan was the supreme ninja clan in the world. Kakashi saw in Naruto's eyes that he did understand and was about to say something when he heard several archaeologists shout about a discovery and everyone headed over towards the new discovery. When they got there, they saw an incredible sight. Before them, almost uncovered was the head of a statue of a magnificent dragon. It was so masterfully carved that it almost looked like it would take flight right then and there. A few hours later they had excavated more of the statue, up to its revealing its forelegs were its wings. The excavation was quickened by the fact that some of the archaeologists were former shinobi who excelled at Earth-style jutsu. Suddenly there was a loud sound like stone cracking. Everyone looked around trying to figure out where it was coming from when Naruto looked and saw the dragon statue shaking as well as its eyes glowing slightly. Naruto shouted out a warning but it came too late as the statue exploded, sending shards of stone as well as chunks of earth that layered the body creating a dust cloud. Suddenly there was silence and the dust began to settle. Everyone's eyes widened as they saw a crater where the statue was previously and thought it was destroyed, but then their eyes widened when they saw what was in the crater of where the statue was. There, in the crater, was an enormous, black dragon. Naruto saw its eyes were closed and it was breathing slowly and guessed that it was over 30 feet long from snout to tail tip. Sakura took a step back, accidentally kicking a rock, alerting the dragon to their presence. The dragon's eyes shot opened and they saw its slit-shaped pupil in its dark amber-colored eyes. These eyes looked around at all the people around it and growled. Kakashi, Naruto, and a slightly shaking Sasuke pulled out Kanai and took defensive stances. Sakura, however, was too scared and she just fainted on the spot. The dragon suddenly stretched its wings, which also shocked the archaeologists by the size of them, and flapped them a few times before leaping into the air at taking flight. Naruto kept his eyes on the dragon as he began to study it and look for a weakness. However something inside him told him wait until the right moment, but that feeling grew as the dragon flew over a section of the ruins that was separate but connected by an underground tunnel. The dragon roared and Naruto heard strange words in the roar, but he couldn't understand any of them. Suddenly the ruin exploded with as much force as the main ruins, leaving a hole in the ground. Everyone's eyes widened as they saw a dragon skeleton in the hole, but their eyes went even wider when they saw muscles, organs, and scales starting to cover the bones as the dragon was revived. When the dragon was finally revived it shook and looked around and this dragon as well as the black one looked at each other before everyone heard a strange voice coming from the one in the air, but they were unable to understand. The revived dragon was a slight whitish in color with gray scales on its belly but was much smaller than the first dragon, only being 15 feet in length. The dragon looked around and saw everyone but then its eyes turned towards Naruto as he began to run forward along with Kakashi and Sasuke and they started flinging kanai at it as his used its wings as shields but some of the kanai injured its wings and it roared in anger as it suddenly breathed a cold wind that froze the ground. Kakashi, Naruto, and Sasuke dodged but some of the archaeologists were caught up in it and were frozen. The dragon leapt forward and bit one of the ice statues and swallowed the half of it that it bit, leaving only the waist down as blood flowed from the frozen corpse. Suddenly Naruto's mind had a shockwave go through it and he noticed his mind began to work harder and faster. Naruto's mind took in a massive amount of detail and instantly spotted a weak spot on the dragon, and he began to attack on that spot with his kanai and shuriken. Kakashi noticed Naruto attacking a spot and ordered Sasuke and a recently awakened Sakura to do the same. Some of the shuriken hit the weak spot along with two kanai but the rest seemed to only irritate the dragon. He heard a voice whisper in the back of his head and somehow he knew that this was a frost dragon and knew its biggest weakness. Naruto looked at Kakashi, Kakashi-sensei, this thing breathes ice right? Why not warm it up a bit? 
Naruto smirked as he said this and Kakashi smirked as well and looked at Sasuke. Sasuke, we found a weakness. It breathes ice so let's warm this fellow up, shall we? Sasuke smirked and him and Kakashi went through a few hand signs and shouted, fire style, fireball jutsu. The two breathed out two enormous fireballs and they hit the dragon making it stumble and fall to the ground when it tried to take flight to dodge. Naruto felt a sudden urge to shout, so he simply followed his instinct and shouted, force. A. N. All shouts will be translated from dragon tongue to the human language since I can't spell over half the words of power from the game Skyrim. Suddenly a huge blast of energy escaped from Naruto's body, exiting through his mouth and hit the dragon, causing it to fly back and crash into a boulder. Everyone stopped and stared at Naruto, even the black dragon who was hovering just outside of the ruins but no one knew it was there since it had flown off when the frost dragon began to attack, who looked just as shocked as everyone else. However he saw this as an opportunity and didn't stop his attack as he jumped up and took his kanai and jammed it under some scales and kicked it, sending it into the dragon's heart. Naruto jumped back and suddenly fell to his knees as he felt exhausted. Kakashi ran up and looked at the dragon which suddenly decayed into nothing but bones as a bright light escaped from the dragon and surrounded Naruto, causing Kakashi to back up in shock as it circled his blonde-haired student before being absorbed. Sasuke Sakura, and Kakashi looked shocked at Naruto before Sasuke began to get angry. What the hell? How did the dead last of the academy beat this thing and what was that power? That power should belong to me, and Uchiha. Why does the loser have it? Naruto fell down as the light faded and was unconscious by the time Kakashi checked on him and he saw that Naruto's chakra was stronger than before, and he realized that it was not the influence of the Kyubi that awakened this power, but rather the force that escaped the dragon and entered Naruto. One of the archaeologists walked up and stared at the unconscious Naruto as if he was a miracle, I thought it was an ancient legend, but apparently it's not. Kakashi looked up. What do you mean? The man looked at Kakashi and back at Naruto. What he just did, was a power that existed ages ago and faded into legend, it was a power wielded by the ancient dragons who once ruled these lands eons before. He is what is known as, according to the ancient legend passed down in my family, a dragonborn. He has the flesh of man, but the soul of a dragon. That power was actually a language spoken by the dragons, it is known as a thuam, our shout in our tongue. Kakashi looked surprised as the man told the legend his family had preserved throughout the centuries, how dragonborn were the protectors of the humans from the dragons and were the ultimate dragon slayers. Sasuke was getting angrier and angrier as he listened to the legend and Sakura was getting angry as well since she thought Naruto was trying to look cooler than Sasuke. Sasuke crossed his arms and, HN, as he looked at his unconscious blonde teammate with malice along with Sakura and Sasuke spoke out, please, these dragonborn must be losers, this dragon was weak, and Naruto looked like he struggled, maybe fate made a mistake when it made him a dragonborn, but whatever, he'll never be stronger than me, I am an Uchiha after all. Sakura agreed with her screechy voice as Sasuke smirked and Kakashi sighed, facepalming himself, at Sasuke's attitude. Naruto woke up and Kakashi looked down and kneeled next to him. Naruto looked up and around. What happened? The last thing I remember was throwing so Kanai and Shuriken at that thing when it blocked them with its wings, after that, nothing. Kakashi explained what happened as well as telling Naruto the legend he was told and Naruto looked excited, so I'm some dragon-powered human? That sounds awesome, Datbeo. Kakashi laughed as Sasuke and Sakura glared at him, which he didn't notice. Kakashi however did notice but ignored it since he could use it as motivation for Sasuke to get stronger. A week later, Team 7 left the ruins since the archaeologists were done excavating and studying. Naruto seemed to be slightly distracted lately especially when as they were leaving a huge rumble was heard in the distance from the direction of the mountains in the distance, in the land of lightning. When he heard that he looked around frantically making Sasuke make fun of Naruto being scared of, some thunder but Naruto ignored him as he felt a presence in the rumbling and felt a calling in it as if someone or something wanted him to come. Naruto shook off the feeling as the four of them took off towards Konoha. A few minutes after leaping from tree to tree Sakura pointed up saying, Kakashi-sensei, is that a Konoha messenger hawk? Kakashi looked up and saw it was and signaled it to come down. When it landed on his outstretched hand he took out the message and read it. He sighed as he took out some paper and wrote a note and put it in the hawk's pouch and sent it back to Konoha and looked at his team, well it looks like Asuma and Team 10 took a mission to the land of waves, 
but they ran into some trouble so they asked for backup and apparently, we are that backup, so let's go, we have a long ways to go before we reach the land of waves. Team 7 nodded and they all began to run and leap through the forest even faster to reach the land of waves even faster. Two days later, just outside the land of waves, Kakashi and Team 7 managed to get a boat and snuck into the land of waves. On the way they saw the bridge that was being built by Team 10's client, Tizuna. They were amazed at the sight and Sakura practically shouted, Wow, it's so big. Kakashi and the boat driver both shushed Sakura, who looked embarrassed that she acted that way in front of Sasuke, who had looked away from the bridge and started his usual brooding. Kakashi apologized to the boat driver, who nodded. After an hour they pulled up to shore and then the boat driver quickly left as soon as they got off. Kakashi looked back at his team. Okay, we have to hurry since Team 10 is recovering from their fight, now let's move fast but also remember to stay silent. Everyone nodded and took off into the trees following Kakashi as he headed towards Tizuna's house. A few hours later they arrived at the house and knocked. A few seconds later a young woman looked out nervously and saw them, H hello, who are you? Kakashi I smiled at her and said, hello, we are the reinforcements sent by the team with you, I'm Kakashi Hataki, the blonde is Naruto Uzumaki. The black haired boy is Sasuke Uchiha and the pink haired girl is Sakura Haruno. They greeted her and she opened the door a little bit more looking relieved and Kakashi looked expectantly, may we come in miss? The woman looked a bit embarrassed and smiled, oh, of course, come I please. My name is Tsunami, Tizuna is my father. Tsunami let them in and shut and locked the door behind them and led them into the living room where they suddenly heard a shriek of, Sasuke-kun. Making everyone but Sakura flinch as a blonde blur came up and glomped Sasuke as Sakura started screaming at Ino to let go of, her Sasuke. Naruto walked by and saw Shikamaru relaxing on the couch and Choji relaxing in a chair eating chips and he smiled and waved, hey guys, what's up? Choji smiled and waved at Naruto while Shikamaru sighed, so you're our backup. Well at least it won't be boring around here anymore. Asuma was exhausted after our fight with some guy called Zabuza but has had his training to improve our chakra control. Kakashi heard this and looked at him. Did you just say Zabuza? As in Zabuza Momochi, the demon of the mist? Shikamaru shrugged and nodded and Kakashi sighed. This was going to be harder than they thought. He looked at Shikamaru. Tell me exactly what has happened up until now. Shikamaru sighed thinking. This is going to be such a drag. Shikamaru then looked at Kakashi and told him all of what happened. Kakashi sighed as he heard everything and went to go check up on Asuma while Naruto was chatting with Choji and Shikamaru and Sasuke was being used as a rope in a tug of war between Sakura and Ino. Naruto stood in the nearby forest with the rest of Team 7 and Team 10 as well as Kakashi stood nearby as he explained to Team 7 what Team 10 had been training in. What Team 10 is doing at the moment is practicing a chakra control exercise by climbing trees. Sakura raised her hand and spoke out, how is that training? We can already climb trees easily. Ino smirked at Sakura who was looking confused, forehead you should pay attention, he meant climbing trees without using your hands. Sakura was confused and looked at her sensei, who sighed, Sakura, Ino is right, you should pay more attention. Now to do this exercise, you must channel chakra to the bottom of your feet and use that to stick to the tree bark, however remember this, too little chakra and you'll slip off, too much and you'll be pushed off the tree, understood? Everyone nodded and Kakashi threw three kanai at their feet and spoke. Use these to make your place when you fall off, try to make it as far up as you can. Oh and one last piece of advice, you might want to take a running start. Everyone nodded and they took off running towards the trees, with Kakashi going to guard Tizuna with an almost fully healed Asuma, until Shikamaru grabbed Naruto's arm and whispered to him, don't run. Take your time and take one step at a time until you get the hang of it and slowly work your way to a run, got it? Naruto nodded but was confused. Why are you giving me advice? Shikamaru chuckled and they turned to see Sasuke falling off the tree while Sakura made it to the first branch where she sat, slightly winded. Shikamaru looked back at Naruto and smirked. I still owe you from the time in the academy when you didn't tell my mom about all those times I was sleeping in class, that's why you troublesome blonde. Naruto chuckled as he remembered that and nodded, well consider us even now. Naruto walked up to the tree, as Team 10 left, when Sasuke shouted at him, Hey dope! What did the lazy loser tell you? Naruto smirked and walked up the tree slowly for an hour. 
Kakashi came back to check on them and saw Naruto running up and down the tree and I smiled. Well, Naruto, you and Sakura are done so you two can guard Tazuna. Apparently you still need work Sasuke. Sasuke was seething at this and began to work even harder as Sakura watched him with hearts in her eyes and Naruto left with Kakashi. As the day ended and they arrived at Tazuna's house at the same time as Tazuna and Team 10 and Ino looked around before she said. Where's Sasuke-kun? Naruto pointed back into the forest saying, he's still working on the tree climbing exercise. Ino smirked, I'll bet you just gave up since it's obvious Sasuke is the best. Naruto rolled his eyes, no Ino, I already got the hang of it. Ino looked at him, not believing him for a minute and he shook his head, sighing. If you don't believe me, then I won't bother explaining it to you. Naruto walked by waving at Shikamaru, Choji, and an almost fully healed Asuma, who was smoking a cigarette. Asuma had heard from Kakashi of his new power and he could tell that Naruto was confused about them, since every now and then he would look like he was thinking hard, which was unusual for him. Asuma smiled and waved back as they entered the house and Tsunami was starting to plan what to have for dinner. A few hours later during dinner, as everyone was eating, including Sasuke and Sakura, who had finished the tree walking exercise just as dinner was finished cooking, Inari, Tsunami's son, slammed his hands on the table and looked at everyone in anger shouting. Why is everyone trying so hard? No one can beat Gato, he'll kill you all, because no one can kill him. There are no heroes so why do you all think you're so strong? Naruto sighed and set down the fork he had and looked at Inari with total seriousness, why are you acting so pathetic? You think that just because life is bad for you that everyone outside this country is happy? Please, my life has been a living hell for as long as I can remember. So don't come to me with your stupid sob stories of how your life is so terrible because I guarantee that mine was worse, because at least you have a family that cares for you, I don't and at least your whole town does not hate you and try to kill you, because mine does. Naruto stood up and left as Inari stood there, crying and shocked at Naruto's words, then he left as well. Sakura looked at Naruto as he walked out the door, stupid Naruto Baka, trying to seem so cool, I doubt half of that stuff is true, I only know he doesn't have a family, so he doesn't have any discipline like the rest of us and he is a troublemaker because of it as well. Tsunami and Tazuna looked shocked at Sakura's comment about her teammate along with Shikamaru and Choji. Ino agreed with her while Asuma and Kakashi sighed, knowing she was an idiot despite her high grades, while Sasuke just didn't care as he wanted to just go to sleep. Kakashi got up and followed Inari to tell him a little bit about Naruto's past. Shikamaru and Choji started to glare at the two girls who were staring at Sasuke while he ate. Shikamaru rolled his eyes at them thinking, these girls are idiots, I have seen a bit of Naruto's life and I know for a fact that he is despised by most of the village, but why that is, I don't know. But I will find that answer out no matter what so I can change people's minds about Naruto, besides this will also drive me crazy until I figure it out. Choji was thinking along the same lines and then, Choji and Shikamaru looked at each other, nodded, and got up to go to their rooms. The next morning, deep in the forest, Naruto was resting peacefully after training himself into the ground the previous night. A few birds landed near and on him and were chirping softly and relaxing some pulling his hair gently. Nearby a woman with long black hair and dark eyes was walking by. She wore a pink, floral kimono that was fully closed but loose enough to hide her figure and sandals and was carrying a basket that had some herbs in it and she saw Naruto lying on the ground. She tilted her head slightly and silently walked over to him, startling the birds and she kneeled beside him thinking, this isn't one of the shinobi Zabuza sama fought, they must have gotten back up, well I could finish this one off here and make it easier for him, but I didn't bring any weapons. The woman reached out towards his neck as if to strangle him, but suddenly started shaking his shoulder instead whispering softly, hey, wake up. You'll catch a cold if you sleep out here. Naruto grumbled and woke up, looking at the woman next to him, and blushed a bit. He sat up slowly, stretching and looked around, huh, I guess I fell asleep while training last night. Naruto chuckled and rubbed the back of his head, then he looked at the woman, who looked to actually be a girl his age, if a year older, and tilted his head and asked, um, who are you? The girl smiled, my name is Haku, and what is your name? Naruto smiled, Naruto Uzumaki, shinobi of Konoha and the next Hokage, Datbeo. The girl, Haku, giggled at the last word and smiled, so Naruto, do you have a reason to train out here? Naruto thought for a moment. Well I want to get stronger. 
Haku nodded thoughtfully. Well, let me ask you this. Why do you want to get stronger? Is there someone you consider precious that you want to protect? Naruto thought for a moment and nodded smiling gently and Haku smiled brightly. Well I believe that when you are protecting someone precious then that is when you truly become strong. Naruto nodded seeing the truth in her words and looked at her, so why are you out here Haku? Haku held up the basket. A friend of mine was hurt working a few days ago, so I'm collecting herbs to help him heal so he can get back to work again. Naruto nodded and decided to help Haku. After working for an hour, Haku left thanking Naruto for the help, but then she turned around and spoke one last thing, oh, and by the way, I'm a boy. Naruto laughed, if that's what you want others to believe Haku, then very well, I won't say a thing, alright miss? Haku's eyebrow twitched, I mean it, I am a boy. Naruto sighed, Haku, I could tell by the way you were picking the herbs, civilian guys would grab it with a bit more force, yet you gently picked them so I knew right away you were a girl besides how many guys have hands as soft as yours. Haku blushed at his words since she knew he was right, but she was even more surprised by how observant he was and then blushed even more at his comment about her hands. Haku looked at Naruto and Naruto put one finger to his lips and smiled. Don't worry, my lips are sealed. Haku smiled, thank you Naruto. Naruto nodded and waved, bye Haku, I hope your friend gets better. Haku nodded and walked away thinking. This one is a strange boy, but he makes me feel so at ease. It's a shame he must die at the end of this week. I probably would have enjoyed being his friend. Haku left deep in thought. An hour later at Zabuza's hideout, Haku walked up to a sleeping Zabuza, as he woke up. He looked at Haku and sighed before speaking, well it took you a little while Haku, what took you so long? Haku told him of her running into Naruto and how they talked. This made Zabuza curious especially when he noticed that when she spoke this boy's name, she seemed to relax a little bit. Zabuza looked at the ceiling as Haku applied the medicine and suddenly the door flew open and a short man with spiky white hair, wearing a tuxedo, jeweled rings, and had a cane in his hand, that was more for decoration than anything, was there with two bodyguards beside him. He had no reaction aside from annoyance as he saw Haku treating Zabuza and he spoke. What the hell is taking so long? I thought you were the dangerous shinobi, Zabuza Momochi, also known as the Demon of the Mist. All I see is a sorry excuse of an old man and his. Zabuza growled and Haku narrowed her eyes as Zabuza spoke in a calm voice. Two things you simpleton, one, Haku is a boy, or have you forgotten that already? And two, I will be ready to fight by the end of the week. So don't get your panties in a knot. Gato walked forward to slap Zabuza but Haku grabbed his wrist and broke it, saying in a cold voice. Don't touch Zabuza-sama. You are lucky he offered his services to you at all. Gato shouted in pain and his guards moved to draw their swords but suddenly Haku was behind them with her senban pressed against vital points in the neck as she spoke in an icy tone. You two had better watch yourselves, otherwise I will kill you. The guards froze and slowly removed their hands from their swords as Haku shunshined next to Zabuza as Gato left with his bodyguards telling Zabuza to succeed, or else. Zabuza looked at Haku and pulled out his right hand from under the blanket, which had a kanai in it. You didn't have to do that Haku. Haku nodded and spoke. I know Zabuza-sama, but we still need him to protect us from the mist hunter Nin. Zabuza sighed because he knew she was right and he looked at the ceiling before he decided to mess with Haku since she looked lost in thought, and he guessed what, or rather who, she was thinking of. So Haku, what's on your mind? Is it that boy you mentioned before? Zabuza laughed at Haku's expression, she blushed a bit and looked at her mentor. And no Zabuza-sama. WYW would I be t thinking about N Naruto kun? Haku slapped her hands over her mouth as she said that blushing even more and Zabuza looked surprised as well but suddenly started laughing making Haku pout. Come on Zabuza sama. That was mean. Zabuza was still laughing and he looked at Haku as he spoke with a smirk. Well, I'll test him to see if he's worthy Haku. If he is, I won't kill him, but I swear one thing, if he doesn't pass my test or he hurts you any time afterwards, well, I'll kill him, slowly and painfully. And who knows, maybe I'll even quit this job for you and him if he does better than I expect. Zabuza laughed at Haku's expression but stopped and looked at her seriously. So let's heal up and I will test him at the end of the week when we meet on the bridge, besides, I always had a sneaking suspicion that that shrimp Gato would betray us. So we'll kill Gato, take the money, and then I'll test the Gaki, 
Not necessarily in that order though. Haku smiled and hugged Zabuza. Thank you Zabuza-sama. Hee <laughs> hee. Don't worry Haku, I can tell you are smitten with him, so why would I deny my tool, the tool of a swordsman, happiness? A. N. For those who don't know, weapons are more precious to swordsmen since their weapons are their swords, shinobi practically get rid of their weapons, kanai, shuriken, smoke bombs, etc. So you get where I'm coming from, swordsmen need their weapons to live and to stay with them, shinobi. Not so much. I got this belief from Naruto. Demon's path and I thought it sounded good since it sounded true. Haku smiled at his words and nodded at the man who was like a father, mentor to her and nodded. Time skip, near the end of the week, Naruto was in the forest exploring the land of waves, and according to Tazuna and some other villagers, there was supposedly a ruin deep in the forest similar to those recently found in the land of fire, a, n. The ruin team 7 was guarding for those who don't know. Naruto was wandering through the forest, searching for it to see if he found something interesting like last time. Little did he know that he was being watched from a distance, a large shadow was watching from the trees and saw him wandering. This creature was an ordinary dragon and it was watching carefully but believed him to be a regular human. However, it saw that this human was like a few it had encountered since it was revived, it was constantly on guard as if expecting an attack, it then made a plan to attack the human and it silently made its way to the ground and crawled towards Naruto. Naruto looked around and sighed in frustration, the ruins he was looking for were hard as hell to find, but figured that it was worth the hard and long search. Suddenly he stopped and listened as a gut feeling told him danger was near. He suddenly realized that he had heard no birds or insects or any other animal in this area and he pulled a kanai from his holster on his right thigh and took a defensive stance. Naruto looked around and his instincts screamed at him to dodge so he leapt to a tree and out of the way of a shadow that had charged and struck at where he was previously, it was a dragon. Naruto looked at the dragon and somehow knew that this was an average dragon, it had brownish gray scales and was about 20 feet long. The dragon looked around and Naruto silently dropped behind it and ran forward and saw a weak point at the joint of where its wings meet its body. Naruto put the kanai away and pulled out two paper bombs and readied them to be thrown. However the dragon turned its head around and breathed fire at him, forcing Naruto to leap out of the way but he came up with an idea. Naruto landed in front of the dragon after pushing off a tree and the dragon looked back at Naruto and growled, before swinging its tail at Naruto which sliced his cheek open, but thanks to the Kyubi's chakra, that closed right away and Naruto breathed in deep and shouted. Foos. A powerful force slammed into the dragon at an angle causing it to lift its front legs and spread the wings in order to stabilize itself but as soon as he shouted Naruto threw the paper bombs and smirked at they impacted right on the joints and detonated, killing the dragon. The dragon collapsed and twitched a bit before its eyes closed and its body glowed before disintegrating into a flowing light that surrounded, circled, and was absorbed by Naruto's body, until there were only bones and quite a few scales left. Naruto looked at the bones and collected some as well as some scales and decided to keep them as mementos until he saw some money where its stomach probably was when it disintegrated lying on the ground and he grabbed it figuring since it was his kill he earned the money, like a bounty or something. Naruto turned around and saw a stack of stones and looking at the base saw a very faint path and went along it. After a minute or two of traveling, he came across another of the mysterious walls and smirked as he heard the chanting coming from everywhere and yet nowhere. Naruto walked forward and he saw a certain group of characters glowing and he walked towards them until he was standing in front of them and the wind they released surrounded and were absorbed by him and he read the word. This word is, life. Hmm, let's try it out, laws. Suddenly, Naruto was aware of all life around him, insects, squirrels, and other animals. It seemed that the larger the animal the better he could sense it within a 30 meter radius and he smirked, but his smirk faded when he lost that sense and looked around. That was cool. Well I better head back, Kakashi sensei is probably wondering where I am. Naruto leapt into the trees and headed back to Tazuna's house. A few minutes later at Tazuna's house, Kakashi was looking for Naruto and was annoyed that the blonde vanished suddenly after talking to Tazuna and some villagers on the bridge while they were taking a break. Kakashi turned at the sound of movement and saw Naruto dropping while his pack made a strange kind of rattling and clinking sound like bones or something and Naruto rubbed the back of his head. Hee <laughs> hee. Hey Kakashi sensei. Sorry for disappearing like that, but I wanted to see those ruins out in the forest, it turns out they are just like the ones we were guarding, and I found a new word, life. Kakashi looked surprised but smiled. Well as long as you didn't get hurt it's fine, 
So what's in your pack? It looks pretty weighed down. Naruto looked at his pack and nodded. There was a dragon guarding the area but I took him out no problem. Datbeo. I even collected so of its bones and scales as a souvenir. Naruto smiled again and took off his pack and showed the bones and scales to Kakashi who saw they had a metal-like quality and looked at Naruto and had an idea planned. Naruto. I want you to hold on to these. You never know when those can be used for something. Naruto smiled and nodded. Naruto went to put his pack in the room he was using and he lied down on his bed and began to think. After half an hour of meaningless thinking, he got up and went down and saw everyone in the living room except Tsunami and he smelled food being cooked so he figured that was what she was doing and he sat down beside Choji who was munching away at some chips while Shikamaru was sitting with a bored expression while Ino fussed at him about being lazy and how he wasn't anything like Sasuke. Shikamaru looked at Naruto and saw a faint scar on his cheek that was slowly fading away and focused his mind as he thought about Naruto's past. He remembered in the academy that Naruto often came to class with a bruise, black eye, or a busted lip, but before he saw Naruto on that day, he thought the kid just picked fights to protect himself or others since he noticed that anyone who picked on someone he considered a friend he yelled at them. However, Shikamaru kept noticing that he healed from those injuries within an hour. Shikamaru closed his eyes and took his meditative stance, surprising Choji and then Choji remembered that Naruto was sitting right beside him since he had been trying to calm Ino down. Shikamaru thought about every detail he knew about Naruto and he began to remember days in his past that involved Naruto, especially, that day. Flashback Shikamaru was walking home with Choji from school and were discussing what they planned to do once they got home. Suddenly they heard a cry and saw a bunch of people walking into an alley and Shikamaru and Choji walked up to the entrance and heard the sounds of something getting hit and heard people shouting in anger. They looked at it and saw a shadow in the middle of the group as the people took turns hitting and stabbing it with knives and they were shocked to see a few shinobi in the group as well. They then heard what they were yelling. Die demon. You'll regret everything you've ever done you monster. I'll make you pay for killing my daughter you demon. Kill the demon. Shikamaru and Choji both covered their ears at that one voice since it was so shrill and loud. It reminded them of Sakura's screeching voice. After an hour of the group beating, stabbing whatever it was the group looked at each other and nodded before leaving silently. Shikamaru and Choji hid as the adults passed and when Shikamaru was sure the cost was clear he looked out of his and Choji's hiding places and motioned his f, um, chubby friend to follow. They walked down the alley and they gasped as their eyes went wide in shock. There before them, nearly unconscious and covered in stab wounds and bruises and his own blood, was Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto was crying which shocked them even more as they had never seen him cry, even when Sakura or some of the other students hit him. Naruto was mumbling something and Shikamaru leaned in and what he heard made his eyes narrow as he looked out of the alley and grind his teeth growling softly. Choji saw this and leaned in as well and he heard Naruto whisper. Please, somebody, just end it already. I can't take it anymore. Why does this keep happening to me? I never did anything to them but they always nearly kill me especially on my birthday, why? Why can't someone just end it? Naruto went silent after that and Shikamaru noticed that even though he was conscious, he had no idea they were there, so Shikamaru looked at Choji and they nodded and picked him up. Both were shocked that he was so light but didn't pay it any mind as they carried him to a hospital. When they arrived they took him to the nurse at the desk and Shikamaru spoke up. Excuse me, nurse, this is a bit of a drag to ask but can you help our friend here? He was attacked but we don't know by whom. The nurse looked and smiled at them before she saw who they were carrying and then Shikamaru noticed her demeanor change even if her expression didn't, as she spoke in a sweet but cold voice. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid we have no rooms available for that, boy. I'm sorry, and it looks like your friend doesn't have long anyways, so again I am terribly sorry. Shikamaru heard the strain as she said, boy, and he looked around and saw plenty of doctors taking short breaks and he looked around for someone to help until Choji tapped Shikamaru's shoulder making him look at Choji who looked nervous, and he could see why now. Every one of the nurses, doctors, and civilians were glaring at them. No, not at them, they were glaring at Naruto. Shikamaru looked around and saw Shuza, Choji's dad walk out of a nearby stairwell and called out to him. Shuza-san. Please we need help for our friend here. Shuza looked over and saw them, he waved, smiling until he saw Naruto's bleeding form and he rushed over and looked at Naruto in shock. What on earth happened to him, he looks like he was thrown off a building. 
Shuza looked at them and Shikamaru told them of how they were walking home when they saw the beating. Shuza looked angry and looked at the nurse, blasting her with ki. Nurse. You will treat this boy right now, or so help me I will get the Hokage and you will regret not helping this child. Choji and Shikamaru were shocked as they had never seen Choji's dad so riled up and suddenly an old voice was heard behind them. Oh, there is no need to worry Shuza, I am already here. I saw young Shikamaru and Choji carrying Naruto and followed them making sure no one tried attacking them from behind to get at Naruto. Everyone turned and saw the Hokage, Hiruzen Serutobi, and while the doctors, nurse, and civilians froze, Shuza, Choji, and Shikamaru felt relief. Shuza nodded at his words, looking relieved as he looked at Naruto as the doctors came and loaded him up on a gurney and then at his son and his son's friend whom he kneeled in front of. I'm proud of you and Shikamaru, Choji. To go out of your way to help Naruto is a very respectable thing to do. Choji smiled lightly and nodded, happy that Naruto would be okay, while Shikamaru simply put his hands behind his head and said. Well it would be too troublesome to leave him there, those people might have come back to finish what they started. Hey, Shuza-san. Why does everyone seem to hate Naruto? I even noticed some of our sensei treating him wrong, like hitting him and such, but when I called them out on it, they said they were just training him. What is up with this treatment Naruto is getting? Shuza looked at the Hokage and sighed. I'm sorry Shikamaru, I am not allowed to say, but I do know that it was for something out of Naruto's control. You know, you and Choji should go see him on his birthday. I heard he spends it alone so I'm sure he could use a friend, it's on October 10th. Shuza knew he couldn't tell but that didn't mean he wouldn't leave a clue for Shikamaru to figure it out and he saw that Shikamaru understood that he gave him a hint and began to think. And if Shuza was right then Shikamaru was just like his father, a genius who was just lazy. End of flashback Shikamaru recalled that and remembered Naruto's birthday and took in his age and cross-referenced everything he knew about the date October 10th. Suddenly his eyes shot open and he looked at Naruto in shock, surprising Ino and Choji, but Choji looked in Shikamaru's eyes and saw recognition and he looked for confirmation as his best friend looked at him. Shikamaru nodded and motioned him to follow before saying out loud. Hey Naruto, me and Choji have been curious about something and we need to speak to you privately in order to understand, mind coming with us? Naruto looked at them with a raised eyebrow and shrugged, sure, I don't have any problem with that. Shikamaru made a few hand signs towards Choji that they invented to pass secret messages to each other and Choji was shocked and looked at Naruto who was following them with a bored expression. As soon as they entered the room Ino snuck up and stood by the door to listen. In the room, Naruto looked confused as to what and why they wanted to talk when they were just whispering to each other and then looked at Naruto and Shikamaru's side and looked serious. Naruto, we know about the Kayubi. Naruto gasped and took a step back in fear that they would attack him. Shikamaru noticed this and his eyes went wide as he held his hands up. Whoa, Naruto, calm down. We aren't like the villagers, we know the difference between you and that fox. After all, Choji and I did a little bit of studying to learn how to make storage scrolls. We know the difference between a kanai and the scroll it's sealed in, so what makes you any different? I just feel bad that me and Choji never helped you in the past except for that one day we found you in that alley, half dead. Outside the room, Ino gasped silently, Naruto was found half dead in an alley. What does that have to do with the Kayubi? Didn't the Yandaimi Hokage kill that monster? Shikamaru said something about a ceiling scroll what was that all about? Inside the room, Naruto sat on the bed, that was you too. You were the ones who saved me that day? Hokage Gigi said two friends saved me but I didn't think I had any friends until you two showed up at my house on my birthday. Shikamaru nodded along with Choji and Naruto fell back on the bed and a few tears fell, making Shikamaru and Choji worry. Naruto smiled softly before speaking in a weak voice. To be perfectly honest, before you guys showed up, I was getting ready to go to the Hokage Monument to end it all. Shikamaru and Choji looked shocked and looked at each other then back at Naruto. Outside the door, Ino covered her mouth as she gasped again, she had never heard Naruto sound so weak before nor had she ever expected him to be so hated and depressed. When she thought of him she imagined a blonde, orange-clothed boy who never stopped smiling and pulled pranks while acting like a total idiot. She always laughed at his pranks and at him when he tried to talk to Sakura. To her and everyone else, he was always the class clown, the dead last, and the idiot. But she had never heard this side of him before and she heard Shikamaru speak again. Back in the room, well then, 
I'm glad we took your dad's advice and visited Naruto when we did, isn't that right Choji? Naruto looked at them and saw them smiling at him while Choji nodded as he eat some more of his chips. You got that right Shikamaru. It would be very boring if Naruto were gone. After all who would pull those funny pranks on the village? I swear my dad has told me lots of times that he loves them, especially your last one. He laughed so hard when he saw the Hokage monument covered in paint that he had trouble breathing. Shikamaru and Choji laughed and after a while Naruto joined them and then after a few minutes, they heard footsteps walking away from the door and Shikamaru went a bit pale and ran out and grabbed whoever it was before pulling the person in as they were complaining. It was Ino, and she looked annoyed as she complained at Shikamaru and then she saw Naruto. She silently gasped as she saw his face, which wasn't smiling like it always was before. It was blank as he watched with no particular interest. Ino's eyes went wide and she stopped struggling as she saw his eyes which looked empty. Naruto turned away before speaking in a solemn tone that made Shikamaru and Shoji frown. What are you doing here Ino? This is a private discussion. Ino looked surprised and looked at Shikamaru as he let her go. Ino looked at Naruto again and saw him staring out the window and Ino felt she had to ask. Naruto. What happened to you? You were always so happy and cheerful. What happened to change that? Before Naruto responded Shikamaru groaned and looked at Ino as she turned her attention to him seeing that he looked annoyed. It was a mask you fool. Naruto doesn't want people feeling bad about him so he puts up this front that nothing is wrong. I mean we found this out when we found Naruto in an alley five years ago half dead. He was practically begging to be released from his pain, but instead we tried to make it go away by being his friends, but sadly we grew apart so it was hard but we supported Naruto as much as we could. Ino nodded and took a deep breath. What were you saying about the Kyubi before? Naruto froze and Ino noticed but she kept her eyes on Shikamaru and he looked dead serious. Ino, what we say, does not leave this room, understand? Ino was surprised by the lack of Shikamaru's laziness but nodded. Shikamaru sighed and looked up. I only recently figured this out which is why I wanted to talk with Naruto and Shoji privately. The Yandaimi Hokage did not kill the Kaiubi, he couldn't. I know because I read up on Biju, they are made up of masses of chakra and you can't kill chakra. So the Yandaimi did the next best thing, he sealed it away. Ino looked confused. Sealed it? Sealed it where? Shikamaru pointed at Naruto and asked. Ino, do you know when Naruto's birthday is? When is Naruto's birthday? It's October 10th we all know that, why? When did the Kyubi attack 12 years ago? October, no way. It can't be, and Naruto? It's inside you. Ino looked shocked as she stared at Naruto, who nodded and spoke. Yes Ino, it is sealed in me. Ino was shocked as she back up into Shikamaru and pointed at Naruto. Sakura's mom was right. You are, Ino stopped talking because Shikamaru spun her around and punched Ino in the gut before glaring at her as she fell to the floor gasping for breath and holding her stomach. Ino, if you call Naruto a monster, I will ask Kuranai to put you under a genjutsu of the Kaiubi attack just so you know the difference between that monster and its jailer, Naruto Uzumaki. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door and Kakashi and Asuma looked in and saw a solemn looking Naruto glance up before looking back at Ino who Choji and Shikamaru were glaring at and Asuma was surprised to see the normally energy filled boy so quiet and Kakashi was shocked as well since he knew about Naruto's mask but never knew him to let it down. Asuma looked at Ino, who was looking at Shikamaru, slightly scared, but very confused. S Shikamaru, you hit me? Why? Shikamaru looked up away from her and closed his eyes, breathing deeply. Because you don't know the difference between a kanai and the scroll it's sealed in. This statement made Asuma and Kakashi look shocked as Shikamaru looked at them. You too knew about it, huh? Well I get why it was hidden, to keep people like Ino from hating or threatening or even killing Naruto out of fear or hate, and don't worry my lips are sealed, I only just found out after all, Ino was just spying on us. Asuma and Kakashi nodded as they wondered why Ino had suddenly got up, claiming she wanted to go to the bathroom as soon as the three boys had left the living room. Suddenly they heard a voice call from downstairs. Excuse me, dinner is ready. They all looked up with the herd movement and saw Naruto standing there with a smile. Well what are we waiting for, I'm starving, let's go eat, Datbeo. Shikamaru and Choji smiled and nodded as they walked by Ino, Asuma, and Kakashi. Ino and Asuma were surprised by the sudden flip in Naruto's personality as they went downstairs to eat. 
Before everyone knew it the end of the week had arrived, and it was around the time that Kakashi suspected Zabuza to return. Naruto had slept in and was snoozing away when while his team went to the bridge site in order to guard Tazuna. When they got there the workers were all nowhere near the bridge and they shouted out that a man with an enormous sword and a person wearing a mask were there and had told them to leave unless they wanted to die. Kakashi and Asuma was confused, as they had heard that Zabuza Momochi, who was known as the Demon of the Mist, was ruthless and yet he let these workers escape. They cautiously walked onto the bridge and then the mist started creeping in and then they couldn't see as they heard Zabuza's voice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, only seven of you are here. Where's the blonde brat? Ino shouted in annoyance and Zabuza scoffed. Not you, the other one. Uh, what was his name, um, oh yeah, Naruto, where is that brat at? Everyone was confused now as the mist lessened in just the area around them and Zabuza was in front of them looking around while his partner was behind him looking at the group behind the mask, when they heard this person speak. Um, excuse me, but can you please tell me where Naruto-kun is? Now everyone was thrown for a loop except Shikamaru and he smirked and walked forward and stopped right in front of Zabuza. I see, so I take it that you, miss, the Konoha shinobi all went wide-eyed at the comment of miss and realized it was a girl behind that mask. My name is Haku. Right, thanks. I take it you, Miss Haku, have become friends with our blonde knucklehead, am I right? Haku fidgeted a little bit, which Shikamaru noticed as he laughed. Or is it something more? Haku froze and blushed up a storm behind her mask as she removed her mask and shyly nodded. Shikamaru walked past Zabuza who was watching him like a hawk and Shikamaru put his hand on Haku's shoulder. Well we'll wait on him with you, if you want, he trained himself into the ground yesterday so he's resting but he'll probably be up soon, that troublesome blonde. Haku looked up and nodded, but looked annoyed when Shikamaru called Naruto troublesome and he noticed and laughed. Relax, he is troublesome, but he's mine and Choji's friend. Haku looked back at Choji who smiled and waved while everyone else was looking confused, when suddenly Sasuke was annoyed that there was no fighting going on and he voiced this annoyance. What's going on here? I thought we were training to kill these losers. Why aren't we killing them? Kakashi sighed. Because, why fight when you can avoid it? Because that's the only way to get stronger, defeat strong foes and take their power for your own. Zabuza suddenly laughed and smirked at Sasuke, kid, you would have fit in perfectly with the Kagaya clan. Kakashi looked confused and Sasuke shouted, What do you mean? Who are they? Zabuza smirked. They were a group of mist shinobi who were like you, they loved to fight and kill, but that is what killed them because they did not know when to stop. Even I know when not to fight, and I am known as the demon of the hidden mist, which in case you didn't know, is also known as blood mist village due to our genin exams under the reign of the tyrant Mizukage, Yagura. Meanwhile in Tazuna's home, Naruto woke up and stretched and he walked downstairs sleepily until he saw the house empty except for him and Inari. Inari was freaking out as he sat in the doorway, holding the door shut and Naruto heard voices outside. Hey, I know Gato said we need to take her but did he say when we needed to? No, what are you getting at? I mean, let's have some fun with this, she has a nice body, I'm sure Gato won't mind in the least if we have a little, us time with her. Naruto was growling now and he walked to the door and Inari saw his rage and was scared. Naruto looked at Inari and whispered to him. I'll save your mom kid, but you have to trust me, got it? Inari nodded as suddenly they heard Tsunami scream for help as Naruto walked out to see them tearing her shirt off but before they finished they heard a shout. Foos. Suddenly the two wannabe samurai were sent flying until they hit a tree and blacked out. Naruto looked at Tsunami who looked shocked but saw Naruto smile at her as she looked relieved but then blushed as her bra was revealed to him and tried to turn away. Naruto however simply took off his jacket and covered her up and was cutting the ropes tying her as Inari ran out and saw Naruto freeing his mother, who was wearing his jacket. Inari hugged his mother and Tsunami saw Naruto looking away with a blush as she smiled and at his forehead in thanks for saving her. Naruto rubbed the back of his head, embarrassed as he walked over and tied the two thugs up and took off after giving Inari some advice. You are brave Inari, I know, you just need to dig deep in order to bring out your bravery. One way to do that is to stand up for yourself, another is to stand up for your family and one more way is to stand up for your way of life as well as the lives of those precious to you, such as the other villagers. Do you understand Inari? 
Inari nodded with a serious expression and smiled. Thanks Naruto. I'll remember your words, I'll stand tall just like you and my father, Kaiza. Naruto nodded smiling and rubbed Inari's head. Good kid, I'll hold you to that. With that Naruto left for the bridge. Meanwhile, at Tazuna's bridge, Sasuke was getting tired of sitting around and suddenly jumped up and threw Kanai at Haku, which Zabuza blocked. Then Sasuke substituted himself with Shikamaru who was talking to Haku when Sasuke lost it and he had drawn another Kanai and prepared to kill her when Haku dodged and made a few hand signs and shouted. Ice style. Crystal ice mirrors. Several mirrors of ice, slightly taller than Haku, formed a dome around Sasuke as he made hand signs while smirking. Please, ice? How pathetic. All I need to do is melt them and you're finished. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Sasuke breathed fire at Haku as she entered the thin mirror but then she appeared in all of the mirrors as the fireball hit the mirror but when the jutsu was finished, the mirrors were still intact, making Sasuke upset but then he smirked as he realized that this is a Keke Jenke and he looked at Haku who appeared in one mirror in front of him. Well look at this, a Keke Jenke, well maybe you aren't so weak after all. How would you like to have the pleasure of assisting me in re-establishing the Uchiha clan? It's a great honor to be mother of future. Elite Uchiha. Haku raised an eyebrow and vanished, before appearing behind Sasuke. I'd rather die than be a breeding machine for you, scum. Sasuke was about to retort but Haku put an ice senbon in a pressure point, knocking Sasuke unconscious. As the ice mirrors dissolved Sakura ran forward screaming about her Sasuke, and was about to punch Haku. But Haku merely took a step back and held one foot out, tripping Sakura and making her fall on top of Sasuke. Haku then knocked her unconscious with an ice senbon as well and looked at Kakashi and Asuma. The ice senbon will melt in two hours, and then they will wake up. However, please have them restrained because I really don't want to upset Naruto-kun for attacking his friends. Kakashi nodded and grabbed them and put them beside everyone else and then Kakashi looked at Zabuza. She's of the Yukie clan, isn't she? Zabuza nodded and told them the story of how he found Haku digging through a dumpster to get food after her family was killed her mother by her own father and her father as well as others by Haku's own bloodline. He used the expression tool to fool others since they assumed he was a shinobi first and anything else after, but in actuality he was a swordsman and their tools are needed to be kept and not thrown away, he treated Haku like his own daughter but after being employed by Gato Haku had to pretend to be a boy so Gato wouldn't kidnap her in the middle of the night and rape her. Kakashi nodded at the wisdom of this. Suddenly Naruto leapt out from the mist and he saw everyone sitting and talking and walked up looking confused until he saw Haku. As soon as he saw her he smiled and waved at her. Hey Haku. It's been a while, how are you? Haku smiled and walked up to him with a slight blush. Hello Naruto-kun, I'm fine thank you for asking, but my mentor wants to test you before we can speak anymore, is this alright? Naruto looked confused but shrugged and smiled. Sure. I don't mind. I hope I pass because I get the feeling we'll be great friends, Datbeo. This made Haku blush and she stepped back as Zabuza walked up and began to inspect the blonde in front of him. Zabuza took his sword, the executioner's blade, and stabbed it into the ground and began to circle him as Naruto looked with confusion but had a lot of determination, which Zabuza noticed and he smirked beneath his bandages and looked at Haku. Well Haku, I don't see anything wrong with the kid, so you can be with him if you want. Haku suddenly appeared in front of Zabuza and hugged him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Zabuza-sama. Wait. What are you going to do? Zabuza took a moment to think and shrugged. Maybe I'll head back to the land of water to help fight off Yugura again. Suddenly Haku clung to Zabuza harder. No. Please Zabuza-sama. Please don't leave me. I do want to stay with Naruto-kun but I don't want to lose you. Zabuza sighed and looked at the Konoha shinobi for advice. Kakashi stood up and stretched along with Asuma and they looked at each other before nodding and they looked at Zabuza. Well we do have one idea, right Asuma? Yay Kakashi, I think it would benefit Haku, Naruto, and Konoha at the same time. Zabuza raised an eyebrow and looked between them as they spoke simultaneously. Join Konoha as a shinobi. Zabuza was about to respond when he stopped and saw Haku looking at him with a woman's deadliest jutsu. Puppy eye jutsu as she wrapped her arm around Naruto's, making the blonde blush at the contact. Zabuza sighed and looked around, then shrugged. Sure. Why not? I'll join Konoha, but you have to help me defeat Yugura sometime. He is threatening the leader of the rebellion, Mei Terumi. 
I want to help her since she is like a sister to me. Kakashi thought for a moment and nodded. I'll mention it to Lord Hokage, is that okay? Zabuza shrugged and nodded and Naruto felt a strange sensation of being surrounded and walked a little ways away as he spoke. Laws. Suddenly a pulse went out and Naruto felt the presence of many humans near the unfinished end of the bridge and turned towards everyone pointing in the direction of the presence of the crowd. We've got company, over there. Shikamaru looked confused by what Naruto did and what he said but saw he was serious and decided to question him later. They turned and Zabuza released his hidden mist jutsu and they saw Gato standing there with well of a hundred. Gato smirked. Well Zabuza. Looks like you're betraying me. Well I guess that works in my favor. I was planning to kill you once you were done anyways. The one who kills them I will pay the most. The thugs behind Gato all smiled in greed as they charged forward and drew their weapons to kill them. However Zabuza stepped forward and made a few hand signs and smirked as he cast his jutsu. Water style. Water Dragon Jutsu. Suddenly a wave of water shot up and formed a dragon that crashed into the bridge, throwing several thugs off the bridge and into the water below. Naruto smirked and ran forward as he made his favorite hand sign and shouted out. Shadow Clone Jutsu. There were several puffs of smoke and a few dozen Naruto appeared and they began to charge into the crowd and began fighting and cutting down thugs without much thought since he was defending himself. Kakashi, Haku, and Team 10 charged into the crowd and began taking down the thugs quickly with Shikamaru and Choji stalling while Asuma, Kakashi, and occasionally Ino, took them down. Haku used her Keke Jenke to easily dispatch the thugs. After a few minutes, only a few thugs were left and they began running away while Gato was looking terrified and shouted at them. W what are you cowards doing? G get back here and fight you idiots. Gato looked back and saw Naruto and Zabuza in front of him as well as armed villagers who had arrived just then at the end of the bridge led by Inari who held a small crossbow. Inari and the villagers looked surprised as Naruto and Zabuza tied Gato up and threw him to the villagers as Zabuza shouted. Alright, you all take him. He's your problem, so you all solve the problem of what to do with him. The villagers smirked and picked Gato up as he screamed for help and Zabuza looked at Naruto and smirked. Kid, you fought hard. I respect that. Now be sure to take care of Haku, got it? Naruto didn't understand what he meant exactly but nodded anyways. Zabuza smirked again and nodded and they walked back to the others and picked up Sasuke and Sakura and they walked back to Tazuna's house for a well-deserved rest. A few weeks later, everyone was standing on the finished bridge and Tazuna, Tsunami, and Inari smiled and Tazuna shook everyone's hand, especially Naruto, who had helped as much as possible with his shadow clones. Everyone thanked them for their help and hard work and Inari ran up and hugged Naruto, come back to visit Naruto Nissan. Naruto looked surprised but smiled and nodded as he rubbed Inari's head and spoke. No problem Inari. If I ever get the chance, I will come visit you and your family. Inari smiled brightly and watched as Zabuza, Haku, and the Konoha Shinobi left until Tazuna realized something. Wait, we never named the bridge. Who has an idea of what to name the bridge? Everyone began to think when Inari and Tsunami looked at each other and smiled as Tsunami got everyone's attention. Inari and I have a name. Tazuna looked at his daughter and grandson as they smiled and said at the same time. The Great Naruto Bridge. Tazuna smiled as he thought about the bridge name and nodded. It's settled. This bridge shall from this day forth be known as the Great Naruto Bridge. Everyone smiled and set to work of making the sign for the bridge. A few days later in Konoha. Hirazan sighed as he read the report given by Kakashi and Asuma and looked up at the two with teams 10 and 7 and the two with them. Zabuza was standing in the corner waiting for the old Hokage to speak while Haku clung to Naruto's arm much to the blonde's embarrassment and everyone else's amusement. Hirazan looked at Haku as she and Naruto chatted and smiled slightly as he saw Naruto happy and he looked up at Zabuza and motioned him to come over. When he did Hirazan looked at Kakashi and glanced at the report of their guarding the ruins and looked back up. So Kakashi, you said Naruto exhibited an unusual power? Was this anything to do with his condition? Shikamaru sighed out loud and looked at the old Hokage. Look, we know of Naruto's condition, as you call it. Hirazan's eyes went wide as he realized they knew and immediately knew that Shikamaru figured it out on his own and sighed. Okay fine, but do not tell anyone you know okay? Shikamaru raised an eyebrow and shrugged. Whatever, it is Naruto's secret anyways, so it's not mine to tell. Hirazan nodded and looked at Haku as she and Naruto kept on chatting and spoke up, getting her attention. 
It appears that you two have bonded rather quickly. Haku and Naruto looked at him and Haku they smiled, with Haku blushing slightly, as they both nodded and Hiruzen began sifting through some papers and spoke again. Well unfortunately for Haku there is not any place available to her and Zabuza at the moment so we will have to have them stay with you Naruto. Is that all right? Zabuza and Haku looked at Naruto, who shrugged and smiled. Sure Gigi, that sounds great to me, Dabeo. Zabuza smirked and Haku smiled as she hugged him saying, thank you Naruto, over and over again, making said blonde blush but nodded and Team 7 left except for Kakashi and Zabuza who were told to stay behind. With Team 7, Haku was clinging to Naruto's arm while Sasuke and Sakura watched and Sakura walked up to Haku. Say Haku. Why are you clinging to Naruto Baka? Sasuke-kun is so much better than him. He's cool and handsome and way stronger than Naruto, so why aren't you acting this way with Sasuke? Haku laughed as she glanced at Sasuke and rolled her eyes. Please, as if anyone in their right mind would like him. No I prefer guys who are sweet, gentle, and caring. And Naruto fits that description if you ask me. Sakura looked shocked and Sasuke see that Naruto had a powerful girl clinging to him and she ignored him. Haku looked at Naruto and pouted a little. Naruto-kun, can we hurry home? I want to see where I'm living from now on. Naruto smiled and nodded as they leapt and ran across the rooftops towards Naruto's house and Sakura followed Sasuke, constantly asking him out, until he told her to go home. Sakura went home determined to make Sasuke hers. Naruto and Haku landed just outside the apartment complex that Naruto stays in. He walked up the stairs with Haku, who grabbed his hand shyly after she had seen the man who owns the apartment complex glaring at Naruto behind the blonde's back. Naruto took out his key and unlocked the door. They walked in and Haku was saddened by the sight. The apartment was a bit run down and he had old furniture that looked like it would fall apart in a day or so and the place was messy. Naruto rubbed the back of his head in embarrassment. Sorry, I haven't had a chance to clean up, what with all the D-ranked missions Kakashi Sensei has us do. Haku nodded as she looked around and noticed most of the trash lying around was empty cups for instant ramen. She looked at him and smiled softly. Don't worry Naruto-kun, I can help you clean up. Naruto looked at Haku and smiled. Thanks Haku and I'll make some clones to help us out as well. Naruto made the hand sign for the jutsu he was famous for and said. Shadow clone jutsu. Suddenly there were seven, short columns of smoke and seven Naruto clones appeared and Haku giggled and they all went to work cleaning up the apartment. Half an hour later, they were done and Naruto and Haku tossed all the bags of trash into the dumpster under the stairs up to his apartment. Naruto looked at Haku and his stomach growled making Haku giggle and he laughed as Haku's stomach growled as well. Naruto grabbed Haku's hand, making the girl blush and said. Come on Haku-chan. Let's go get something to eat. I haven't been to Ichiraku's in forever. Haku nodded and smiled as she and Naruto ran off towards Naruto's favorite ramen stand. At Ichiraku's ramen stand, Tuchi was serving food to a costumer and looked back at his long-haired, brunette daughter, Ayame, who was looking around. Tuchi smiled as he knew she was looking for her favorite blonde and chuckled quietly and walked over to her. Relax Ayame, he'll come eventually, you know he loves it here. Ayame looked at her father and nodded before sighing and leaning her face onto her hand. I know he will dad, but it's been over two months now, I hope nothing happened to him. Nothing happened to who? Ayame and Tuchi looked up and saw Naruto standing there smiling and Ayame ran around the stand and hugged Naruto. Naruto, it's been so long, I was hoping nothing bad happened to you. Naruto laughed and hugged Ayame back. I'm fine Ayame-chan. I was just out on my first C-ranked mission and then my team got a request for backup on another C-ranked mission that got bumped up to a rank. Ayame let go and smiled. Well congratulations on your first C in a ranked missions Naruto-kun. Naruto smiled and sheepishly rubbed the back of his head. Ayame turned and saw a young girl who was glancing curiously at Ayame and Ayame looked at her curiously before looking at Naruto again. Um. Naruto-kun. Who is this? Naruto looked at Haku was face palmed himself. Oh man, I forgot to introduce you. Ayame, this is Haku, she is the apprentice and adopted daughter of Zabuza Momochi. Haku, this is my very first friend, Ayame Ichiraku. Haku and Ayame shook hands smiling but secretly they were glaring daggers at each other, both thinking the same thing. She had better back off right now. Naruto-kun is mine. 
Naruto smiled as they stopped shaking their hands and Ayame went behind the stand and looked at the two and Naruto brought Haku up and they sat down and Naruto waved at Tuchi. Hey Tuchi Oji, this is my new friend Haku. Tuchi smiled and walked up to her. Well, it's nice to meet you Miss Haku. I'm glad Naruto is starting to make friends, it's such a shame that he didn't have someone like you a few years ago, he was always looking for a friend. Haku looked at Naruto who looked down solemnly and Haku and Ayame looked sadly at him and Ayame smiled brightly before saying. Well, enough of that, now Naruto, I believe a Naruto special is in order for you successful missions. Naruto looked up, his mouth watering and his eyes wide as dinner plates and he smiled and nodded. Haku smiled and turned and said. I would like one medium pork ramen please. Tuchi nodded and left Ayame to make Naruto's special order which they made for his 8th birthday and every birthday from then on as well as the very few special occasions Naruto had. Tuchi finished Haku's ramen a few minutes before Ayame finished Naruto's and served it to her. Haku had a bit and immediately loved the ramen. She smiled happily and began to eat it with vigor. When she was halfway done, Ayame put a huge bowl of ramen filled with every flavor they had available in front of Naruto. The sight of this bowl made Haku gasp and drop her chopsticks into her bowl of ramen. The bowl in front of Naruto was ten times the size of a large sized ramen. Naruto's mouth was now a waterfall of saliva. He smiled brightly and began to dig in at an unbelievable pace. Ayame smiled happily as he ate the ramen she made for him. Haku shook her head and began to eat, thinking Naruto looked cute while eating that way and by the time she finished Naruto was halfway finished. To say she was surprised was like saying Rock Lee was like his sensei, it was a massive understatement. A few minutes later Naruto was drinking down the broth of the huge bowl and put it down and sighed loudly. Ah, that was as great as always Ayame-chan. Naruto gave her one of his foxy grins making both Ayame and Haku blush at the sight of it but Ayame smiled and walked around before hugging Naruto while sending discreet glares at Haku while saying. I'm glad my favorite blonde shinobi likes my cooking. I hope to cook for you forever since you enjoy it more than any of the other customers. Tuchi laughed in his head, knowing what Ayame truly meant. However, Naruto simply smiled and hugged her back and they let go and Naruto stood up, and reached for his wallet before Tuchi shook his head. No need kid, this one is on the house, it is for a special occasion after all. Naruto nodded his head but still pulled out his wallet. I know, but I want to pay for Haku-chan's ramen as well. Tuchi looked at Haku who blushed and looked down and Tuchi smiled and laughed softly. Oh alright kid, it costs 750 yen. Naruto nodded and paid for his newest friend's meal. They left waving bye to Ayame and Tuchi. They left and took to the rooftops back to their home. At Naruto's apartment, Naruto and Haku walked up and saw Zabuza standing outside the door. They waved and he returned it while smirking under the bandages around the lower half of his face. So. How was your date? Naruto and Haku blushed and Naruto waved his hands frantically. D date? And no, you got it wrong. I was just letting her meet some friends of mine and had lunch at the same time. Zabuza laughed and shook his head before pointing his thumb at the door. So, do you mind letting us in shorty? Naruto fumed at the shorty comment but ignored him as he walked by grumbling and unlocked the door letting them in. Zabuza walked in and immediately sat down on the couch looking around. Damn kid, this place is a dump. Naruto sighed, I know, people kept breaking in and wrecking the place while I was out as a kid. Zabuza raised an eyebrow at this along with Haku and Haku walked up and grabbed Naruto's hand gently. I suppose since you two were gonna be living here I might as well tell you. Zabuza and Haku looked confused and Naruto, who now had a totally different look on his face, one of emptiness, slipped his hand out of Haku's grip and walked over to one of the windows and leaned against the window sill. Zabuza and Haku both looked at each other, slightly disturbed by the change in the blonde's demeanor. Have you two noticed the people when I'm around? Zabuza and Haku looked surprised but thought back when they arrived, everyone but a few was glaring at the group, or more specifically, at Naruto. They looked at Naruto and nodded before Naruto sighed. Well it's because they see me as something I'm not. Do you know about the Kyubi? Zabuza and Haku nodded slowly, every nation had heard of the Kyubi the most fearsome of the nine biju, the tailed beasts. Naruto looked at them. Twelve years ago on October 10th, the Kyubi almost destroyed the hidden leaf village, and the Yandaimi Hokage sacrificed his life to stop it. However, the academy gave an edited version, 
The textbooks said the Yandaimi killed it, but I know different. The Biju are pure chakra and can't be killed, only sealed. It was sealed in a baby who was born on the very same day, one whose chakra coils had not fully developed yet. Zabuza and Haku nodded and waited for him to continue, though their instincts were trying to tell them something was obvious but they didn't know what it was until they heard Naruto's next words. My birthday is October 10th and I am 12 years old. Haku and Zabuza froze and looked shocked as Naruto stiffened as he waited for their reaction. Zabuza stared at Naruto before looking down and Haku ran forward and hugged Naruto and sobbed slightly into his shoulder as Zabuza spoke softly. Such a terrible burden, and we now know why you had few friends as a child, the old man must have forbidden everyone from talking about it, am I right? Naruto nodded as tears fell and he turned in Haku's grip and hugged her back. Zabuza walked up and put his hand on Naruto's head. Well kid, I will tell you this one thing. Don't think of yourself as the demon, if anyone is a demon, it's me. I mean, my nickname is, Demon of the Mist, for a reason, because I fight like a demon out of hell. Zabuza laughed loudly and this cheered Naruto up slightly as he made a slight joke. But apparently you aren't the Demon of the Mist anymore, for two reasons. One, you are now part of the leaf, and two, you have a daughter that you raised with love and care. Not very demonic if you ask me. Now Haku and Naruto were laughing as Zabuza was crying anime tears. Come on Gaki, that was a low blow. After a few hours of chatting, joking, and dinner, the three went to bed, Naruto in the main room, Haku on a futon in Naruto's living room, and Zabuza on the couch in the living room. The next morning, Naruto and the rest of Squad 7 were given the day off due to the mission they completed in Wave Country and Haku was getting a tour around Konoha while Kakashi took the dragon bones and scales from Naruto and went somewhere with Zabuza. Sasuke was still seething at the blonde for having a girl with such a powerful Keke Jenke clinging to him and Sakura was started believing Haku was trying to get Sasuke and while she believed she liked Sasuke and not Naruto, Sakura was preferring that Haku just be a servant to Sasuke while she was his future wife. Needless to say Naruto and Haku ran off before the screeching and boasting began. Haku was following Naruto through a forest just outside Konoha that he used to visit when he was a boy. The two arrived to find a giant mound with flowers around it. Haku gasped at the beauty and Naruto led her to the top only to raise an eyebrow when he noticed a hole in the top of the mound. He dropped down the hole and Haku followed, just as curious as Naruto. They walked around and saw it was an ancient catacomb. They walked through the halls and heard a strange sound, like a growl. They looked around the next turn and saw what looked like a corpse in ancient armor and a horned helmet walking around with a strange looking sword. They stepped out and tried sneaking by but the creature turned around and suddenly a word popped into Naruto's head as the thing spotted them and ran forward, raising its sword to attack. It's a Draugr Deathlord, I don't know how I know that so don't ask, but right now something is telling me to kill that otherwise it'll kill us. Haku nodded and her and Naruto leapt forward and pulled out several kanai and threw them at the Draugr. The Draugr was hit in vital areas and fell to its knee but stood up and began to attack again. It swung its sword at Naruto, who narrowly dodged it. Damn, that thing nearly took my arm off. Okay, now I'm gonna tear that thing apart. Naruto ran forward as Haku launched several Senbon from behind the Draugr and hit spots that would paralyze a human, but they only slowed down the creature. However, that was all Naruto needed as he ran forward and stabbed the Draugr in the heart and it stepped back a few steps before it fell over dead and Naruto and Haku sighed in relief. Man, that was a close one. Haku nodded in agreement and they snuck through but luckily there were no other Draugr Deathlord, though there were numerous traps and floor panels that were sensor pads. However, once they reached the end of the ruin Naruto and Haku saw a wall like the one Naruto was guarding in the land of fire and had found deep in the woods of the land of waves. He heard the chanting again and smirked as he walked forward. Haku looked with confusion as Naruto looked at one particular set of symbols on the wall and whispered to himself. Ice. Hmm. Let's try this word out. Haku, you might want to step back a bit. Haku looked confused but nodded and moved away from Naruto as he looked at a nearby giant river rat that snuck into the room, it was about three feet long, not including the tail, and it looked at Naruto as he breathed deeply and shouted. Ayas. A blast of white light surrounded by a tiny vortex of wind was released from Naruto's mouth and when it hit the rat, the rat was frozen solid. Haku looked shocked and Naruto went up and tapped the frozen rat, which shattered, making him look shocked and he chuckled slightly and looked at Haku. Well, 
I think I might have gotten carried away, but it looks like you aren't the only ice wielder anymore. Naruto had his foxy grin on and laughed as Haku laughed a bit as well. They walked back towards the entrance of the catacomb and leapt out of the hole they dropped down. Once they were out they saw it was mid-afternoon, and decided to go back to Konoha, especially since Naruto wanted to show Haku his favorite place in the entire village besides Ichiraku's. So they took to the trees and leapt back to Konoha. Back at Konoha, Naruto and Haku arrived at the gates and Naruto waved at Kotetsu and Azumo, the two chunin who guarded the main gate into Konoha. Naruto had introduced them to Haku and Zabuza when they got back from the mission from Wave. They were old friends of Naruto and loved to chase Naruto down whenever he pulled a prank to try and see how long it took for one of them to catch him. Aruka was in the lead with a time of 1 hour and 35 minutes, which was almost an hour sooner than most Jonin and 20 minutes faster than the Anbu. Naruto suspected he was senior type, possibly the strongest sensory abilities in Konoha, rivaling or even surpassing some high-ranked Anbu. Azumo and Kotetsu waved him and Haku in and they walked by talking excitedly about what happened. Naruto stopped and Haku stopped as she saw Naruto narrow his eyes ahead of them, and when she turned to look, she saw Sasuke and Sakura standing there. Haku scowled along with Naruto as the blonde spoke. What do you want Teme? Sasuke smirked as his eyes suddenly turned red with two tomo in both of his eyes, and he spoke arrogantly. Simple dope. I'm going to teach you to respect your superiors and then I'm going to take that ice wielding and give her the honor of restarting the Uchiha clan with me. Naruto rolled his eyes and walked past Sasuke and went to the training grounds, with Sasuke following close behind and Naruto started training with Haku and Sasuke seethed and ran forward with a kanai to kill Naruto but Naruto jumped back as did Haku and Sasuke turned and made a few hand signs before shouting. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Sasuke breathed an enormous fireball at Naruto. Naruto sighed and breathed deeply and shouted. Ayas. The icy wind was released from Naruto's mouth and struck the fireball. However, instead of blowing the fireball away like Naruto was expecting, it instead froze it solid and it fell to the ground with a solid thud asterisk. Sasuke was in shock and began to get pissed and was about to throw several shuriken before he found he couldn't move and heard a few voices. Phew. That was a close one wasn't it Naruto? They turned and looked and saw Shikamaru, Choji, Kakashi, Zabuza, and the Hokage. Hiruzen looked impressed at the ability Naruto displayed and smiled at his surrogate grandson. Well Naruto, that is quite the unusual ability you have there. I see you have also improved your taijutsu considerably. Naruto laughed sheepishly and rubbed the back of his head. Ah, me and Haku were training when Kakashi was training Sakura or Sasuke when it was my turn to train with Kakashi, though which doesn't happen very often since he seems to be training the Uchiha Teme more than me and Sakura, though probably reluctantly judging by his expression whenever he starts to train him. Kakashi sighed and nodded at the old Hokage. Yay, the council is forcing me to train only Sasuke and train Sakura a little bit and totally ignore Naruto, but I would rather train Naruto since he has the most potential. Sasuke and Sakura shouted in anger at this and Kakashi looked at them with a dead serious expression. The reason Naruto has more potential than either of you is because 1, he trains to protect those precious to him and 2, from what I've seen, he trains until his bones break and then he trains harder whenever he heals. And one more thing, Sakura, a puppy has more potential than you because you completely neglect your training and constantly diet, which is bad for your health and will constantly make you weaker. Sakura looked down sadly and Sasuke was seething and vowed to take Naruto's power for his own once he mastered the Sharingan. Hiruzen sighed and motioned for everyone to go home and they left, Kakashi vanishing, Sasuke walking off, brooding, with the pink-haired, huge-foreheaded, howler monkey following close behind and Naruto and Haku walked off chatting happily, ignoring the glares sent to them by Sasuke and Sakura. Sasuke swore to himself that he would train to get stronger than Naruto and steal his power so that he could use it to kill Itachi. Naruto looked at his surrogate grandfather as he, Team 7, Haku, who was clinging to Naruto's arm, and Zabuza, who was glaring at Sasuke and Sakura to keep them from trying anything, walked towards the Hokage Tower since Hiruzen said he wanted to speak with them. Naruto and Haku chatted happily forgetting that Sasuke attacked them just a few minutes ago and Sasuke and Sakura were glaring at Naruto and Haku. Naruto looked ahead of them at Kakashi and spoke up. Hey, Kakashi-sensei. Kakashi turned around and looked at Naruto with his little orange book in his hand. Yay. What's up? 
Naruto rubbed the back of his head. What did you do with those souvenirs I got in Wave? Kakashi raised his visible eyebrow and thought for a moment before his eye widened in recognition. Meanwhile Sasuke, Sakura, and Hiruzen were listening in carefully. Oh those. Well I took them to an old friend of my sensei so I could get them checked out. They looked very interesting and I wanted to learn about the properties they possess. Besides I think you could make something with them, and if you can I asked him to make something out of them. Naruto nodded and smiled. Awesome. Thanks a lot sensei. Kakashi nodded with an eye smile and looked back at his book. No problem Naruto. Just think of this as my apology for being forced to train Sasuke and Sakura more than you. Naruto nodded and Haku smiled at Naruto as she knew he forgave his sensei, since he was forced to train the Emo Uchiha over the rest of the team by the civilian council. Kakashi saw Naruto's grin out of the corner of his eye and knew that Naruto forgave him. I'm glad Naruto is such a nice guy. I know if I were in his place I would be downright pissed off. Naruto began thinking and chatting with Haku when Sasuke spoke up. Hey dope. What are these souvenirs you were talking about? Naruto looked back and shrugged. I don't know. What do you think? Naruto turned back around and started smirking while Haku giggled and Sasuke and Sakura got angry. Kakashi and Zabuza chuckled lowly while Hiruzen laughed at Naruto's joke and looked back at the blonde and smiled. He was happy to see his surrogate grandson happy and with such a cute girl. He then started thinking about what was on his mind earlier and made an abrupt decision. He looked up as they finally reached the Hokage's office and they entered and he sat down before shuffling through a few papers and scrolls before pulling out one mission scroll. I have a mission for Team 7 plus Haku and Zabuza. You will be escorting a noble to a town in the Land of Wind. He wants to leave within the hour so meet him at the North Gate when you are prepared. Everyone nodded and replied at the same time, minus Zabuza of course. Yes sir. They left to get ready, however Naruto saw how Hiruzen was glaring at the paperwork on his desk and Naruto could have sworn he heard the pile chuckle and grow as it did so and his eyes went wide. Holy shit. I think that pile of paper is alive. Hiruzen was signing the papers but for every one he signed five took its place and Naruto could swear the paperwork was laughing almost silently now and he spoke up. Uh. Oji-san. Why not use the shadow clone jutsu? Hiruzen looked at Naruto with a blank expression before his eyes widened and he started banging his head on the desk muttering to himself. Stupid. I'm so stupid, so Kami damned stupid. Naruto sweat dropped and left and went to his apartment and packed up, however as he was packing he suddenly got the sensation that someone was watching him and he looked around. However no one was around and he shrugged. In another dimension. A woman with black skin, red eyes, and red markings on her body is special on her face, giving her an exotic and at the same time slightly demonic look, was watching Naruto through a portal and smiled softly. My, he is so powerful. He is obviously dragonborn judging by the feeling of power he emits, but he also releases an aura of peace. I must meet him. He has sparked my interest like no other. I can only hope that this ice-wielding girl will be willing to share him, I certainly hope so. If not I will convince her to share. However, I must decide where and when to meet him. Let me see his thread of fate and I will know. The woman closed her eyes and began to trace the thread of his fate and smiled as she knew exactly when to meet him. She adjusted her portal slightly and the scene shifted in its water-like surface and she walked through the portal into the image. Back in Konoha, Naruto walked up to the gate to see he was the third one to get there. Sasuke and Sakura had arrived first and were waiting with the client and Haku and Zabuza arrived right after Naruto. Team 7 sighed as they knew they had a long wait for Kakashi, but they were surprised when they heard a familiar voice behind them. Yo! Team 7 stared incredulously at the silver-haired Jonin who had arrived, on time. Team 7 put their hands into the ram hand sign, closed their eyes in concentration and shouted. Kai! They opened their eyes and saw Kakashi sweat dropping. Is it really so hard to believe I can be on time? His answer, not surprisingly, was. Yes, it is. Haku and Zabuza looked at each other and shrugged before Zabuza got everyone's attention. Okay. Now that the fun fest is over, can we go? Our client looks like he's ready to go. Everyone nodded and they left. Time skip. Three days later, Sasuke, Sakura, Naruto, Haku, and Zabuza were breathing heavily in the desert of the Land of Wind. They had dropped the noble off with some Suna shinobi and were on their way back when Naruto felt an all too familiar pull. Forgetting about the heat, Naruto looked up at Kakashi. Hey Kakashi sensei, I feel it again. 
Haku and Zabuza looked at him confused while Kakashi looked back and nodded before speaking. Which way is it this time Naruto? Naruto thought for a moment before pointing slightly southwest. Kakashi nodded and motioned everyone to follow him and they did so, albeit very reluctantly. After a few minutes Naruto felt his combat urges rise and his looked up and saw a shadow way up in the sky. He narrowed his eyes and waited as the shadow dropped down. It was a brown scaled and tan bellied, dragon with long crooked horns and he narrowed his eyes. An elder dragon, to think something this strong is here. Kakashi and the others began flinging kunai and shuriken at the dragon which only bounced off most of the scales, a few cracked some scales and others managed to find weak points. However all this did was piss off the elder dragon as it roared and breathed fire at them. Everyone leapt out of the way as Naruto breathed in and shouted. Ayas. A burst of icy wind shot from Naruto's mouth and hit the elder dragon's flame, cancelling it out and Naruto took this chance to run forward ad slide under it and when he stopped he stabbed two kanai at its stomach, but one broke while the other just stopped on its scales. Naruto got an idea however, and slipped the unbroken kanai under the scale making the dragon roar in pain and it tried laying down to smash Naruto flat but Naruto managed to make a shadow clone and substituted himself with it. Naruto leapt up and threw a kanai at the slightly confused dragon. The kanai, luckily enough, hit the dragon's eye and Naruto breathed in deeply before shouting once again. Foos. This knocked the dragon back slightly and that was when Kakashi leapt forward, his hand encased in lightning that sounded like birds chirping. Rakery. Kakashi jabbed the jutsu into the side of the dragon and was splashed with its blood. Kakashi leapt back and Zabuza leapt forward swinging his executioner's blade around and stabbed in the wound. But before Zabuza's sword could reach the dragon's heart the dragon knocked Zabuza away and into Haku, who couldn't use her jutsu due to the lack of water. Sakura was hiding behind some sand dunes and Sasuke was knocked out by the dragon's tail when he tried to sneak up behind it. Naruto reached in his pouch and pulled out a kanai with an explosive note attached and threw it into the wound. The kanai did not reach the dragon's heart but it was close enough as an explosion tore the dragon's torso apart and it collapsed and slowly died. As it died it looked at Naruto and spoke a few words. May. Aus fall ba du alduin, dovakin. A. N. Translates to, fool. Suffer the wrath of alduin, dragonborn. Naruto narrowed his eyes as he understood the words somehow and spoke. You are the fool, whoever this alduin is, I will crush him. With the village helping me, even your so called destroyer devourer master will not stand a chance. A. N. For those who don't know, all dragons have three part names, Alduin's is Aldu in, translation is in the sentence. Naruto turned around as the dragon died and its flesh disintegrated and its soul flew into Naruto like rushing winds. Naruto turned around and walked up to the dragon and began collecting his prize, a few more dragon bones and scales some yen and apparently a few kanai and a demon wind shuriken. Naruto put the yen, kanai and demon wind shuriken in his pack before handing Kakashi the scales and bones and smiled. Maybe your friend could use some more to make that gift you promised me. Kakashi thought for a moment before nodding with an eye smile. Sure, I'll let him know. Naruto nodded and they all continued until they reached the ruins wall. Naruto walked up vaguely paying attention to the chanting and kneeled staring at one word as he learned it and read it aloud. Hum. This word says, whirlwind. Naruto stood up and motioned everyone to stand back. Naruto breathed deeply and shouted. Wold. Naruto suddenly found himself shooting forward at incredible speeds, landing safely 15 feet away from where he was before and he smiled and laughed as he waved at the others and they ran up to him. Haku reached him first and smiled before she saw something behind her that made her eyes go wide and when everyone arrived they went wide-eyed as well and Naruto turned around to see what looked like a sphere of purple roiling energy. The energy dissipated and in its place was a woman with black skin and red markings on her face. She was a little over five feet tall and when she opened her eyes they rivaled Kuranai in redness, but had a gentle look to them. She was wearing a midnight blue dress that did little to cover her C cup S and hugged her hourglass figure until it pooled a little bit around her feet. The woman smiled and bowed, revealing a large about of cleavage and she looked up, particularly at Naruto and smiled a little bit more before standing straight. Greetings mortals, especially to you, Naruto Uzumaki. She spoke with a sweet voice and walked forward slowly and stood in front of Naruto and had a gentle smile on her face before Kakashi, Zabuza and Haku jumped in front of Naruto and put their hands on their weapons, 
Haku forming Ice Senbon, and Kakashi spoke. Who or what are you and what do you want with Naruto? The woman smiled and nodded. I am Azura, Daedric Mistress of Dusk and Dawn and Mistress of Visions of the Future. As for what I want with the boy, well, he has sparked an interest in me that no other has ever managed to do. He intrigues me and also I find him very handsome, more handsome than any human I have seen in this world. Haku suddenly appeared in front of Azura and spoke coldly. Stay away, Naruto is mine. Azura giggled lightly and sighed. Little girl, I knew you were possessive but I am willing to share him with you, I am not fickle as I find you quite attractive as well. Haku, Zabuza, Naruto, and Kakashi all went wide eyes with Kakashi and Zabuza having a nosebleed at the intentions of the Daedra. Naruto was blushing and Azura looked at Naruto before winking and turning back to Haku and grabbing the ice wielder by her hand and leading her away slightly before whispering. Girl, you must know about the Uzumaki boy. He is the last of his clan. As such by your world's law, he is eligible for what your world calls the CRA, the Clan Restoration Act. This means he will have to take on multiple wives. Haku's eyes widened and nodded before she asked. What clan is he from? Azura smiled before speaking. In actuality he is the last of two clans but one I cannot tell because the time is not right for anyone to know, but the clan I can mention is the Uzumaki clan that was wiped out over 50 years ago. Haku's eyes widened and nodded as she had heard about the Uzumaki clan in stories and legends as she and Zabuza traveled, they were supposedly masters at Fuinjutsu and Kenjutsu and were also known for their incredibly long lifespans and their stubbornness. Haku looked over at Naruto who waved when he saw her looking and Azura smiled softly at Haku and Naruto. Azura held out her hand and a deep blue energy began to gather in her hand. The energy took on a formless mass and it began shifting until it formed a crescent moon shape and solidified into an ivory colored moon with chunks of the moon being deep blue in color. She then pushed the object into Haku's hands. Haku held it looking confused and she looked at Azura silently asking what it was. Azura smiled. This object is my moon, it is known as Azora's moon. This will allow you to communicate with me and Naruto, once I give him my Azora's son that is, no matter where we are or where you are. Haku nodded and looked at the object in wonder and looked up at Azura who smiled and walked over to Naruto. Kakashi and Zabuza were looking at the Azora's moon in Haku's hand when Azura held out her other hand and a dawn coloration mix of energy, red, orange, yellow, etc appeared before condensing into a single mass and forming a sun-shaped object. It was a circular-shaped stone center that was orange in color, with yellow crystal forming four flattened spikes on the top, bottom, and sides with four more flattened spikes that were smaller and faced diagonally while being made of red crystal instead of yellow. Azura smiled and held out the sun-like object towards Naruto. Naruto took it and looked at it in wonder and Azura spoke up. This is Azura's sun. My sun this will allow you. Naruto, to communicate with me and Haku, who I have given my moon, no matter where you or we are. And believe me when I say, I certainly would enjoy talking with you every now and then. It gets very lonely in the realm of twilight sometimes. Naruto looked at the sun and up at Azura. How do I know you mean what you say? How do I know you won't turn on me when you feel like it? Azura frowned and closed her eyes. I see the mortals of your village have made you become very cautious and somewhat distrustful of strangers. Naruto nodded at Azura with a serious expression. Of course, you try living my life, you would be as well. Azura nodded sadly and suddenly hugged Naruto and spoke softly. I am truly sorry for how you were treated. However, I will do what I can, along with Haku to make sure you do not feel that pain again. Naruto nodded as they separated. Kakashi and Zabuza were thrown for a loop by Azura's actions and Zabuza looked over at Haku who had walked over when Azura hugged Naruto. Haku was looking at Azura before shrugging and walking up to hug Naruto as well. Haku whispered the same promise as Azura and Naruto smiled before hugging her as well. Naruto and Haku separated and Naruto looked at Kakashi and said. I think we should head home now Kakashi sensei. Meanwhile Sakura walked up and looked at Azura. You're interested in Naruto Baka? Ha, huh, not very good taste in men, though maybe it's because you're weaker than he is that you see him as strong. Azura narrowed her eyes and grabbed Sakura's neck and picked her up. Listen girl. Do not criticize me, I am stronger than your precious Uchiha, so do not act as if I am weak like he is. Azura dropped Sakura as Sasuke was seething at what Azura said and was about to attack her when Kakashi put his hand on Sasuke's shoulder and shook his head when Sasuke looked at him. 
Kakashi looked at Azura, Haku, and Naruto and spoke. Okay everyone, Naruto is right. We need to head back to Konoha. Let's go, we have a long distance to cover. Everyone nodded and they took off heading towards the Land of Fire. Two days later in the Land of Fire, it was around dawn of the second day of traveling when Kakashi and Zabuza looked back and saw Azura and Haku talking to Naruto and they smiled beneath their mask and turned back around and looked at each other and nodded before they came to a stop to rest. Naruto, Haku, and Azura sat down when they saw Kakashi and Zabuza stop. Sasuke and Sakura stopped as well and Sasuke sat down by a tree glaring at Naruto, Haku, and Azura. Sakura sat down near Sasuke and stared at Sasuke with hearts for eyes and then glaring at Haku and Azura and switching back and forth between staring at the Uchiha and glaring at Naruto's group. Kakashi and Zabuza saw this along with Azura and Haku and Kakashi and Zabuza sighed in annoyance while Haku and Azura ignored them and continued to talk to Naruto. Suddenly a sound was heard and a dragon dropped down from above and landed nearby with a loud thud. Everyone stood up and moved out of the way as a stream of fire came out of the green-scaled dragon's mouth. Naruto leapt up to a tree and pushed off and landed behind the dragon as Haku landed on its right, Kakashi on its left, Sasuke in front, and Zabuza beside Kakashi and Haku made several hand signs and cried out. Ice style. Ice spear jutsu. A spear made of ice rose out of the ground right in front of her and made its way towards the dragon which moved to the left towards Kakashi and Zabuza and whacked them with its wing but they managed to roll under it and Zabuza swung his sword and managed to cut the dragons and it roared in pain as the two rolled all the way from out under it and beside Haku. The dragon turned and was about to breath fire but suddenly a few kanai hit it and bounced off the side of its head and it turned towards Sasuke who was smirking as he said. HN, an overgrown lizard like you can't beat an elite shinobi like me. Naruto breathed deeply and sighed. Hey Sasuke Teme, shut up and just fight already, you're just pissing it off. Hey dragon, look over here if you want to fight. The dragon looked at Naruto and its nostrils flared as it growled out a single word much to everyone but Azura, who was beside Sakura who had passed out from fear, as surprise. Growl Dovakin. Naruto smirked as the dragon turned around fully and he breathed in deep and shouted. Ayas. The dragon breathed fire at the same time but the two attacks met and released a heavy mist and Zabuza decided to take advantage of that and rushed forward silently and jumped up and over the dragon slashing at its neck and the dragon was looking around trying to find who injured it but Zabuza was too silent as he leapt around slicing the dragon with his executioner's blade. The mist suddenly cleared in the middle of one of Zabuza's strikes and the dragon sees Zabuza and whacks him with his tail sending him flying and he hits a tree making Haku gasp and run over to him and check Zabuza. Naruto got pissed then and shouted at the dragon. Foos. The dragon was hit with the force of the shout and Naruto charged forward after making shadow clones and those clones ran forward and he smirked as the clones suddenly glowed a bit before exploding. Kakashi's eyes went wide as he saw the technique and looked as the dragon leaned back in pain and Naruto pulled out a demon wind shuriken and threw it and it slit the dragon's throat. The dragon roared a gurgling roar as it drowned in its blood. The dragon collapsed and tried breathing but it finally died. Azura watched in awe as the dragon disintegrated in a bright light and she saw its soul be absorbed into Naruto and Naruto stood straight and smirked at the dragon skeleton as he collected the bones and yen. The he saw something interesting, it was a katana with a reddish-orange swirl for the guard and an orange handle wrapped in red silk threads, and when he drew the sword he saw that the blade was a brilliant silver as if it had just been forged despite the fact it was inside the dragon. He picked it up and his eyes went wide. He looked at Kakashi and back at the sword. This katana feel perfect in my hand. Kakashi and Zabuza went wide-eyed, the technique Naruto used before forgotten as he looked at it and Zabuza spoke up. Kid. Do you even know what that is? Naruto looked up at him and shook his head and Zabuza looked at the sword and saw some seals on the blade itself that confirmed the theory he had. Kid that is a sword of the Uzumaki clan of Uzugakir. Those seals on the blade are proof enough of that. Naruto looked at the sword in awe and smiled as he strapped it to his back. He felt the familiar tug again and knew a wall was nearby. Naruto followed his instincts and found the wall with everyone behind him. Azura watches closely with Haku as Naruto kneels in front of a section of the wall and looked at a set of symbols. Naruto stands up and looks at the group. The word this time is fade. Kakashi nodded and motioned everyone to get back as Naruto breathed in and out deeply and said. Fium. 
Naruto suddenly turned opaque and then clear as he looked like a ghost and he looked around and Zabuza tossed a kanai at Naruto making Haku gasp and fuss at him. However she stopped when the kanai passed right through Naruto without hurting him. Naruto had brought up his own kanai and threw it to block Zabuza's but his went through it and then through Zabuza himself and he looked at himself and smirked. Awesome. I'm untouchable, but I can't touch anything either. Everyone smiled, except for Sasuke and Sakura, from how impressive the ability was. Suddenly Naruto became solid again after 30 seconds of being intangible. Naruto looks at himself and laughs. Guess it doesn't last very long. Oh well. Let's get back to Konoha. I'm sure you like it Azura. Azura smiled gently and nods. I hope so. As long as no one tries messing with you I'm sure I'll like it there. Naruto smiled and they all took off towards Konoha. The next day, at the gates of Konoha, Kotetsu and Azuma were sitting at the guard hut by the gate looking at each other as they played their card game. Azuma was about to choose a card when Kakashi suddenly appeared along with Team 7, Haku, Zabuza, and a beautiful black-skinned woman with eyes rivaling Kurenai. Azura bowed in greetings when Kotetsu and Azumo asked for their ID. Hello. I am Azura. It's a pleasure to meet some friends of Naruto. Kotetsu raised an eyebrow. Wait. You're a friend of Naruto. You better not be like the villagers here. Azura narrowed her eyes and frowns making her look evil. I am not like these pitiful villagers. In fact, if it wasn't for Naruto caring for this village especially his few friends here I would destroy this village. Kotetsu and Azumo look at each other and nod at her smiling while Azumo speaks. Good. Just remember, you hurt Naruto we won't hesitate to hurt you. Azura smiles happily. I would never, nor could I ever, hurt Naruto. Azura hugs Naruto to prove her point making Kakashi, Kotetsu, and Azumo all think one thought. Man, this kid is so lucky, two hot chicks who likes him. The group walked into town and everyone but Sasuke and Sakura surrounded Naruto to keep him out of the view of the villagers. Though occasionally a villager tried slipping by to get at Naruto, making Sasuke smirk as they tried but his smirk fell as he saw each and every attempt fail. They eventually reached the Hokage's tower and the assistant would have glared but everyone but Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura narrowing their eyes at her made her just announce their presence to the Hokage and they were let in and Hiruzen saw the woman and sighed. Welcome back Kakashi, give me your report tomorrow. Now who is this young woman? Azura bowed. Greetings Lord Hokage, I am Azura, Daedric Mistress of Dusk and Dawn and Mistress of Visions and I am here for Naruto, he has sparked an interest in me that I've never had before. This means I will be staying in your village with him. Hiruzen's eyes widened as he stared at the god like being in front of him and what she had said. He read between the lines and saw that she meant that she took quite a personal interest in him. Naruto walked into his apartment and sighed as he looked around. I need a bigger place, I'm out of room. Azura walked up to the door and looked in. Hum, it is rather small, but I can share a bed with Haku, unless you'd rather I share the couch with you. Azura whispered into Naruto's ear making the blonde blush and turn around quickly making Azura giggle as he stuttered. And no, that's okay, why you can share with H. Haku. Haku walked up with Zabuza as Azura spoke and Haku blushed, remembering that Azura said that she had an attraction for her as well, while Zabuza laughed. Man kid, you're really slaying them, aren't you? Naruto blushed even more while trying, and failing, to deny Zabuza's words. Naruto sighed and walked into the apartment and fell onto the couch. He looked up at the roof before he fell asleep. As he slept Azura went a little rigid and she sighed, looking at Naruto. Oh dear, it appears he has come. Azura sighed and shook her head as if she were talking about a child who caused a lot of trouble. Zabuza and Haku looked at her and Zabuza asked. Who's here? Shiagorath, he is a Daedric prince, the prince of madness to be exact. He is absolutely insane and completely unpredictable but not inheritably evil. It seems he took Naruto's spirit into his realm to speak to Naruto. They then looked at Naruto and wondered what would happen. In Shiagorath's realm, Naruto woke up suddenly, feeling as though he had been dropped. He looked around and saw he was in a clearing of a misty forest. When he looked around some more, he saw a long grey table with lots of plates and bowls with food on and in them and lots of goblets and cups with wine and other various drinks. On the opposite side of the table, in the center was a large purple cushioned silver throne. In the throne was the oddest man he had ever seen. He was about six feet tall with white hair that was balding. 
He wore a purple jester suit and had a strange smile on his face. He had on purple shoes that had an abnormally long tip that rose and curled around to nearly touch the shoe again. Naruto saw his eyes and they were a bright blue, so bright they were almost white and in these eyes Naruto saw lots of mischief and playfulness, but also a sense of great power. Why hello. It appears I have a new guest. Hooray for little old me. The old man spoke with a high-pitched and slightly playful voice. Naruto looked around. Um, hello. Can you tell me where I am at and also, who are you? The man laughed. Where are we? Well, we are neither here nor there, but then again, we are there and here at the same time. As for little old me, I am Shiagorath, Daedric Prince of Madness, at your service. The man laughed as he spoke, giving Naruto the suspicion that this man, no this Daedric Prince, was insane. However, there was also a feeling that he could be dangerous if he wanted and this made Naruto weary. Shiagorath noticed this and laughed. Oh, don't you worry your blonde little head my boy. Old Shiagorath won't hurt you. But the mind of Pelagius, a, n, can't remember the name of the guy whose mind you are in during the meeting with Shiagorath, might. You see, his mind was twisted and warped and filled with danger, mostly of his fears and sorrow. However, you must clear this mind and restore his sanity, but how can you do that hum? How can this be done? With a sword or spell could it work? Maybe it could. But there is a better way, the W-A-B-B-A-J-A-C-K. The mad Daedra waved his hand and a strange staff appeared in his hand. The staff was about five feet long, three spiraling lines that ran along the length of the staff that went up towards the tip, gray, and at the tip was hollowed out and was carved into three faces with gaping mouths showing the hollowed out portion of the staff and the lines stopped in between each face. The three faces showed a different emotion. Anger, sadness, and happiness. Shiagorath held out the staff towards Naruto. This is the Wabajak, a mystical object that will help you cleanse this mind of its insanity. Naruto took the Wabajak and looked at it. Wait. If you're the Daedric Prince of Madness, why do you want me to bring sanity back to this place? Shiagorath laughed some more and sighed. Because, as long as there is insanity here, I can't leave and I oh so wish to move on and spread madness elsewhere. Shiagorath laughed even more insanely than before and looked around. Around us are three paths, each one leads to a different part of Pelagius's mind, you must solve each problem before I return you back to your world. Naruto nodded and walked off towards one of the three gates. After the three trials, a, n. I can barely remember the trials so just look it up on YouTube or something. Naruto walked out of the third pathway and back into the clearing and he saw Shiagorath sitting in the same spot looking maniacal and he walked up and patted Naruto's shoulders. Good show boy, good show. Now I'm off to spread madness, but before I go, I bestow upon you my wabajack, use it in all its, a, just take the darn thing and go home now. Naruto was surrounded by a purple energy similar to how Azura appeared and he woke up on his couch with Azura, Haku, and Zabuza staring at him and suddenly something fell from thin air and landed on Naruto's head. Ouch. That hurt. What was that? Naruto looked and saw the Wabajak and looked confused. So that wasn't a dream? Azura sighed and shook her head. No, it was Shiagorath, and to think, he gave you the Wabajak, a staff of mysterious power that is just as unpredictable as he is. Azura looked at Naruto as he studied it and suddenly there was a knock on the door and Zabuza answered, they saw it was Sakura looking reluctant to be there, who said that Team 7 had to meet at the bridge near the training ground. Zabuza said he would pass the message on to Naruto and close the door. Naruto waved at Zabuza saying he had heard and he sighed and stood up, stretching. He walked out the door, waving by to the three in the house and leapt off towards training ground 7. At training ground 7, Naruto landed at training ground 7 where Sakura was bugging Sasuke to go out on a date with her when a portal appeared behind Naruto and a very familiar laugh was heard. Why hello young Naruto, to think you would be here? My, what a small world, eh? Naruto groaned and turned around. Hello Shiagorath. Sasuke and Sakura looked confused as he clapped his hands in joy and bounced on his feet a bit before looking at Sakura and Sasuke. Hee <laughs> hee. So these two are my next targets, eh? H -a, -h, -a, -h, -a, -h, -a, h a time for the madness to begin. So for the next three hours Shiagorath began to annoy the crap out of Sasuke and Sakura, much to Naruto's amusement and a late Kakashi's amusement as well. 
Naruto explained who Shiagorath was and Kakashi made it a note to avoid him unless it was absolutely necessary. For the next hour Kakashi sat there with Naruto while Shiagorath annoying Sasuke and Sakura even more, and he had even nicknamed them Duck Ass Head and the Pink Banshee, making Naruto laugh as that as he told Shiagorath that that was his nickname for them. Shiagorath laughed saying great minds think alike and Naruto told Shiagorath of his pranking streak in the academy and the mad prince had to admit that Naruto had him impressed with some of the pranks. Shiagorath even mock bowed and told Naruto that he was almost his equal in causing madness. Naruto accepted the praise and laughed as he and Shiagorath discussed pranks, making everyone in the village aside from Haku, Kakashi, Azura, the Nara clan, the Akamichi clan, Anko, Ibiki, Hanada, and Zabuza shiver in fear. Kakashi sweat dropped at the two as Shiagorath went back to pestering Sasuke and Sakura. An hour later, Sasuke, Sakura, and Naruto were sitting on the bridge while Shiagorath was talking to Naruto and Kakashi sighed as he cleared his throat and everyone looked up. Yo. I have some good news, I have nominated Team 7 for the Chunin exams, all you need to do is fill out these forms and turn them in to be able to apply, and remember, it's voluntary. Naruto took his slip, signed it and handed it back same with Sasuke and after a slight bit of hesitation, Sakura singed hers with a shaky hand and gave hers and Kakashi smiled, told them they had to be at the academy in room 301 in a few hours, waved, and disappeared in a puff of smoke. They were walking along when they noticed a box painted to look like a rock with two eye holes and they stopped but Naruto's eye twitched and he sighed. Okay. Come on out Konohamaru, and bring out your friends too. Sasuke and Sakura looked at Naruto and then back at the box as it replied in a muffled voice and then exploded and there were three coughs in the large cloud of smoke and a voice said. I think we used too much explosive powder, another voice replied. Uh, sorry Konohamaru, that's my bad. Another voice was heard, this one female. Don't worry about it, Udon, we can fix it next time. Naruto sighed as the smoke cleared showing three academy students. The first was a boy with a sleepy look, glasses, a bit of snot hanging from his nostril, and goggles on his head, he wore a dark blue shirt and brown pants and blue shinobi sandals. The second was a girl with orange hair that was put up in two gravity-defying ponytails. She had rosy patches on her cheeks and was wearing a pink shirt and blue pants. The third was Konohamaru Serutobi, Hiruzen's grandson and Naruto's self-proclaimed rival. He wore his hair in a pineapple ponytail had a blue scarf that was way too long, a blue shirt and black pants. Naruto then noticed one more thing, they all had green goggles similar to the ones he had when he was in the academy. Konohamaru. What are you doing? The boy smirked and looked at his friends, and they nodded. The boy with glasses struck a weird pose and said. The smart kid, I'm Udon. The girl struck a different yet equally weird pose and said. The Y future Kunoichi, I'm Moegi. Konohamaru back flipped and landed in between the two and said. The leader, I'm Konohamaru, and then they shouted together. And we are, the Konohamaru Corp. Team 7 sweat dropped at the kids and Naruto sighed. No, you're embarrassing. The three kids dropped anime style and stood up shaking it off before Konohamaru spoke up. Hey boss, you said you'd play ninja with us, so let's go, Sasuke laughed. A ninja playing ninja. How pathetic can you get you dope? Sakura screeched her agreement and Naruto laughed. Only you and Sakura would think it's pathetic Teme. I'm actually teaching these kids stealth and stuff like that when we play these games. I guess you wouldn't know that since you're a spoiled brat and a fangirl banshee who has less skill at a shinobi than an academy student. Sasuke and Sakura shouted in anger and when Konohamaru and his friends agreed they chased them and then Konohamaru bumped into a guy who appeared to be wearing a cat suit and purple makeup followed by a girl with fishnet shirt under a grey shirt and a black skirt that reached her ankles and slightly flared out a bit to give maneuverability and obi on her waist holding a giant iron fan on her back. They both wore the headbands of Suna, the hidden sand village. Hey kid, watch where you're going. The guy picked Konohamaru up by his collar and the girl behind him spoke up. Hey Konkuro, put him down, we didn't come here to cause trouble, besides, what if he comes and... I don't care about that Tamari, this kid bumped into me and I'm gonna teach him some manners. He was about to punch the kid before Naruto appeared beside him and grabbed his fist. Listen buddy, if you don't want to feel lots of pain, I'd let him go. The guy in the catsuit, Konkuro, 
felt something tap his stomach and he looked down and saw Naruto holding a kanai near his stomach and he gulped and dropped Konohamaru. Hee hee. Sorry. Suddenly a sound was heard and sand came rushing down, making Tamari and Konkuro freeze and go pale. The sand cleared, revealing a boy with red hair and a tattoo in the shape of the kanji for, love, on his left temple. Konkuro stuttered out. Uh. H. Hey Gara. A. N. I'm feeling too lazy to describe Gara right now so if you don't know what he looks like in the canon then you can look him up on Wikipedia or something, Gara narrowed his eyes. Konkuro, you're a disgrace to our village. Konkuro stepped back in fear and would have stuttered out a response if Gara didn't give him a look that said, shut up, Gara looked at Naruto. Forgive my brother. He won't be a problem anymore. Naruto stepped back a bit and nodded. So who are you? Gara studied Naruto closely and spoke. I am Gara of the desert, and I'm curious, who are you, and the boy whose hair resembles a duck's ass? Naruto snorted and laughed as Sasuke seethed and spoke like he was the best thing in the world. I'm Sasuke, Sasuke Uchiha. I am an elite genin of Konoha. Naruto rolled his eyes and looked at Gara. I'm Naruto Uzumaki. Ignore the teme, he's full of himself due to him being spoiled like a little baby, and the pink-haired girl is Sakura. She's the useless fangirl of Squad 7. Gara nodded while Tamari glared at Sakura, who was glaring at Naruto. Great, a fangirl, it's girls like this that make us real Kunoichi look weak. Naruto Baka, you dare make me look bad in front of Sasuke kun. Shanaru, who does that loser think he is? Naruto ignored Sakura and Sasuke and held out his hand towards Gara, surprising him and his teammates. Gara simply stared at Naruto then at Naruto's hand and back at Naruto and just nodded. I look forward to facing you in the Uchiha in the Chunin exams. Naruto pulled his hand back and nodded smirking. Same here Gara. I'm sure you'll be a challenge to beat. Gara smirked psychotically and nodded in the three left, with Tamari glancing at Naruto curiously before she left with her team. At the academy a few hours later, Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura walked up the stairs and saw a group of genin in front of a door with the sign for 301 labeled above the door. There were two chunin in front of the door knocking down a team of genin. They said something about them going easy when compared to the chunin exams. Naruto narrowed his eyes as he thought those two looked familiar and that something was off about them in the door itself. He then realized that there was a genjutsu because they were only on the second floor. A. N. Naruto isn't an idiot in my story, at least. Not as much of an idiot he is in the anime or manga. It was then that Sasuke decided to open his big mouth. Okay, you morons. Drop the genjutsu. This is downright pathetic if you think it can fool in Uchiha. Sakura agreed, stating they were only on the second floor, and the two chunin looked at Team 7 and saw Naruto sigh, shake his head, and go on ahead of the rest of his team, who ignored him. The disguised chunin, Katetsu, pointed at Naruto. You know, maybe you should have followed him. He seems to know what's going on. Naruto stopped and looked at Kotetsu and blinked before smiling. Yo. What's up Kotetsu? I didn't recognize you at first, but now I do, good disguise. Kotetsu laughed and he and Azumo dispelled their henge jutsu. Hey Naruto. I was wondering if you would pick up on that. You seem a bit sharper than before. I take it now's the time you've been waiting for? Naruto smirked and nodded. Yep. No more holding back for me. It's time for me to show these people just who I am and how strong I am. Azumo laughed and nodded. Kami. I feel sorry for any Ur who thinks you are a weak idiot. Naruto chuckles as everyone, even Sasuke and Sakura, watch the interaction between the two chunin and the blonde. Sasuke was confused and he thought to himself. What are they talking about? Wait, don't tell me. Was the dope holding back all these years? If that's true, just how strong is that loser? No he isn't strong, he is just a pathetic clan less loser, a nobody. Sakura was thinking along the same lines but the focused on the conversation as Naruto laughed. I know, and unfortunately, that is everybody, unfortunately for everyone but me that is. Kotetsu, Azumo, and Naruto chuckled as the chunin nodded in agreement. Only a few knew that Naruto was actually very strong, he just chose to hide his strength. The few who did know were the Hokage, the two chunin. Kotetsu and Azumo, who Naruto trusted since they didn't hate him and enjoyed his pranks. A few Anbu such as Yugo Azuki, she was part of his guard that protected him. And she had done more than the other Anbu who only stopped the fatal blows. 
Ibiki Morino, he had done a mental evaluation on Naruto when he was young to make sure the boy wouldn't turn against the village due to all the abuse he took, Anko Midarashi, who had saved Naruto on many occasions and had also watched over him in secret when he was younger, Hinata, not that anyone aside from the Hokage knew that she knew, since she stal uh, I mean, observed, Naruto from a distance, and Danzo, who kept a close eye on his supposed future weapon. Naruto waved by to the chunin and walked up the stairs as Sasuke and Sakura watched him with curiosity. A minute later they arrived in a wide open area and a genin in green spandex and orange leg warmers appeared, challenged Sasuke to a fight, and beat him with only taijutsu. Lee's sensei appeared and got onto him for almost using a secret technique and they introduced themselves. They left and went up the stairs towards where the exams were. As they were walking, Naruto turned his head and spoke. By the way Temei, you do realize that Genjutsu on the second floor was to weed out the weaklings, right? So thanks to you, we now have more unneeded competition. Sasuke stiffened and glowered at Naruto while Sakura screeched at Naruto about how Sasuke would beat him into the ground and it didn't matter how much competition there was, Sasuke would win. You know, the usual fangirl ramble. Naruto ignored her as they made it to room 301. There in front of the room were Kakashi, Zabuza, Haku, and Azura. Team 7 looked surprised but Naruto smiled and walked forward where Kakashi explained that only teams of three could take the exam and Azura and Haku hugged Naruto and had a cheek each, making the blonde blush, wishing him luck. Suddenly a shout came and they turned to see Sasuke gasping with Shiagorath rolling on the floor laughing with a life-size replica of a man who looked similar to Sasuke and the Sharingan active in its eyes leaning against the wall. Sasuke would have attacked but Shiagorath vanished with his voice wishing the team good luck, making Azura sigh and shake her head. Well Naruto-kun, good luck in your exam. I know you will pass. Azura winked at Naruto and said blonde blushed a little bit and smiled. You bet I will, Datbeo. Azura giggled at his verbal tick and nodded along with Haku, then she pulled him away and whispered to him and he glowed slightly like he did when he absorbed a dragon soul and he smiled and thanked Azura for something. A. N. If you don't know what happened, look up Skyrim mission to meet the Greybeards. They stepped out of the way along with Zabuza and Kakashi. Who handed Naruto a picture of a man holding a beautiful katana with a blade that resembled the greenish scales he collected in an incomplete set of armor that resembled scales, A. N. Scaled armor used by the military. It resembles scales and is nearly indestructible, only imagine it the same color and texture as scale plate armor and in the background there was a girl with her hair up in buns and a pink Chinese styled shirt, black pants and blue shinobi sandals looking at the sword and armor with an odd expression, and team 7 entered room 301. When the doors closed behind them, they found several other genin teams glaring at them from all over the classroom, especially the Iwa genin, though they were shocked at Naruto's appearance and glared even harder at him. Suddenly they heard a quiet voice. Hello Naruto. They turned and saw Ino, standing beside Shikamaru, who muttered, hello, and Choji who waved while eating some chips. Naruto grew solemn and nodded at Ino before turning and ignoring her. Ino flinched a bit when she saw his emotionless eyes when he looked at her and she sighed and bowed towards Naruto, surprising everyone but Shikamaru and Choji. Naruto, please forgive me for what I said back in Wave Country, I was out of line. Naruto looked surprised but sighed and put his hand under Ino's chin and lifted her head up so they were looking eye to eye. Naruto then smiled lightly, making Ino blush, and said. You are forgiven Ino, just please don't tell anyone about that, okay? Ino gasped and nodded, before smiling shyly. Shikamaru noticed that and smirked as he muttered about, troublesome blondes, suddenly they heard a voice shout out. Heck yay, we're all here. They turned and saw Kiba, Akamaru, Hanada and Shino walking up. Hanada blushed and poked her fingers together when she saw Naruto and she hid slightly behind Shino as she spoke. H hello Naruto-kun. Naruto looked at Hanada and smiled at her. Hey Hanada, how are you? Hanada blushed more and quietly stuttered out. I I'm fine, and Naruto-kun. Naruto found Hanada's stuttering a bit cute as well as her shyness. He then looked at Kiba who was gloating out loud about how he would beat everyone in the exams, this made a guy with silver hair and glasses walk up. Hey, I would keep it down. These tests aren't meant to be taken lightly, people here are tense and you rookies are not helping the situation. Everyone looked around and saw several genin glaring before Naruto saw three groups not glaring, the Suna team. 
A team from Kuma which had two blonde haired, one of which had pale skin while the other had tan skin. Girls and a girl with red hair who had dark skin, and the third team was a team from Kiri. Consisting of two guys and a girl, one of the guys was dark skinned that kind of had and brown hair that had a reddish tint and a strange silver armor, a n. Mithril armor from Elder Scrolls IV, Oblivion. He will be wearing the helm in battle but not out of battle, and two swords, one a golden double edged sword with a bright light shining, the other sword could only be described as demonic with a serrated single edge and there was a sort of red glow but the sword's edges there was an icy blue aura. The second member of the team was a boy with dirty blonde hair and armor similar to the first guy's armor but his was lighter and a darker color. The girl of the team had white hair and deep green eyes. She had two dots in the middle of her forehead and she had pale skin. She wore a pale blue battle kimono with a white sleeveless shirt that hugged her hourglass figure underneath the kimono. The guy who had walked up to the rookies got their attention again. As you can see, it is very tense, but I think I'll give you rookies a bit of help. My name is Kabuto Yukushi and I am kind of a veteran of these exams. Sakura tilted her head. Really? Is this your second or third try? Kabuto stopped and flushed while looking embarrassed. Hee <laughs> hee. Um, actually it's my seventh try. Kiba made a comment that was ignored as Kabuto pulled out a deck of cards and explained how he had gathered info every time he took the exam. He called the cards his ninfo cards and he pulled one out and channeled chakra into it before a poof of smoke appeared and when it cleared, the card showed a map of the elemental nations and a kind of holographic bars that showed the level of competition in the current Chunin exams. He explained about how he also had info on most individuals and Sasuke stepped forward. You have individuals? Kabuto nodded and asked. Who do you want to know about? Rock Lee, Gara of the Desert, and Naruto Uzumaki. Everyone looked at Naruto, who sighed and looked at Sasuke. Teme, I'm right here, you know. If you want to know my strengths, just ask Yubaka. Everyone was surprised by Naruto's attitude, which was different from the academy. However, Shikamaru, Choji, and to a slight extent, Ino were not surprised by his attitude since they saw part of his mask slip back in the land of waves. They saw Naruto look down at his jacket suddenly before he took it off, showing the dark blue shirt that hugged his form revealing his slightly muscular form and that his jacket was dark burnt orange on the inside and he showed everyone that it was reversible as he turned it inside out and zipped it up inside. That's better. Everyone stared and he raised an eyebrow. What? Just because I like the color orange doesn't mean I like orange that bright. This shade of orange is more my style. Naruto then looked at the pants of his jumpsuit and shrugged before looking back at Kabuto. A. Hey, go ahead and show the info already. Kabuto blinked but nodded as he channeled Chakra to another card and revealed the stats of Rock Lee. Rock Lee, Team 9. His teammates are Neji Hayuga and Tenten Higarashi. His team has taken 78D ranks 25C ranks, and 1A rank. According to this it was a C rank but the presence of a missing Nin up the mission rank. Naruto raised an eyebrow as Kabuto pulled out another card and revealed the info on Gara. Gara of the Desert or Gara Sabaku as he is known by his family name, his teammates are Tamari and Konkuro Sabaku, his older siblings. Wow, he had done 89D ranked missions, 74C ranked and 1S ranked mission. And here's something really freaky. Every mission he's ever been on, supposedly he has never had a single injury. Everyone's eyes went wide and they looked over at the Suna team and back at Kabuto who pulled out a card and revealed info on Naruto. Naruto Uzumaki, Team 7, teammates are Sakura Haruno and Sasuke Uchiha. His team has done 98 D ranks, A, N. Kakashi is a slave driver in this when it comes to D ranks, and 1C turned a rank mission and is responsible for bringing former A rank missing Nin, Zabuza Momochi along with his apprentice, adoptive daughter Haku to join Konoha. This bit of info caught the ears of the Miss Genin and they walked over. The one with dark skin spoke up. Hold on. You were the one who convinced Zabuza to join Konoha. Naruto looked at him and raised an eyebrow. Not exactly. More like Haku convinced him. Zabuza just came along since Haku was being a bit clingy to me. The girl in the Miss Genin group giggled and she looked at him and spoke. Well I can see why. You aren't that bad on the eyes. Naruto flushed a bit and the other two missed Nin laughed. Wow. I can't believe you actually found a guy that you were interested in Kamara, it's about time. The girl, Kamara blushed and then punched the two guys' shoulders. S shut up Lewis, you two Lathan, are all hurt both of you. 
They stopped laughing after a few seconds and smirked showing they were gonna tease her later on. The girl then sighed and looked at the leaf genin and sighed rubbing the back of her head and she looked right at Naruto. Sorry for that comment, I kinda blurt things out sometimes. Naruto laughed and shook his head. Don't worry about it, to be honest, you're cute as well. Kamara blushed and blinked when Naruto held out his hand. I'm Naruto Uzumaki. What's your name? Kamara smiled and shook his hand. Kamara. Kamara Kagaya, it's nice to meet you Naruto-kun. Kamara blushed as she realized what she said and the blonde guy, Lathan tilted his head. Did you say Uzumaki? I thought that clan was wiped out. Hum so that means you are the last of your clan. He started chuckling and looked at Kamara. Well Kamara, looks like you found one heck of a guy. Since he's the last of that clan, he is eligible for the CRA. Kamara blushed and looked down as Naruto tilted his head but a few of the rookie nine, the clan heirs, eyes went wide as they looked at Naruto. They didn't know there was an Uzumaki clan, and since Naruto was the last, he was eligible for the CRA. Sasuke and Sakura looked away both thinking the Uzumaki were weaklings compared to the Uchiha since they were wiped out, not even thinking about the fact that the Uchiha clan was wiped out as well. The Uzumaki clan, I have a clan. Cool. But why were they wiped out? Lathan sighed and shook his head when Lewis spoke up. They were wiped out in the last great shinobi war. I gotta say, your clan were tough bastards, it took Iwa, Kumo, and Kusa together just to wipe out half of the forces of the land of whirlpools. Heck. Uzushio nearly decimated the whole Iwa army, and they have the second largest army next to Konoha. Everyone was in shock that the Uzumaki clan lived in a country they never heard of and that they had their very own village. Sasuke was upset because the Uzumaki clan was so strong but again began thinking they were weak compared to the Uchiha. Sakura thought along the same lines. Lathan then spoke again. I actually heard that they learned Kenjutsu from the samurai in the Land of Iron, and then mixed several styles to form their own unique style known simply as Crimson Whirlpool. Supposedly that style focused on lots of evasive maneuvers and quick, accurate strikes at vital points before the user of the style moved back out of range of attack. Naruto quirked an eyebrow. That's cool. I wonder if I could find a scroll with the Uzumaki fighting style someday? I already found an Uzumaki sword if what Zabuza said is true. Lathan's, Lewis's, and Kamara's eyes went wide and moved close to him. You have an Uzumaki katana. Awesome. Where'd you find it? Sugoi. Can I see it Naruto-kun? Everyone looked confused and they looked at Naruto who was confused by all the attention and they heard someone walking over and saw one of the girls on the Kumo team and she looked at Naruto with calculating eyes, making everyone tense and then she smiled. Hello. I'm Yugito Ni. What's your name? Then the other two walked up and the other blonde, who was well endowed making Kiba drool slightly at the sight, sighed and spoke to Yugito. Yugito. What's got you so interested in this guy? Though I must admit he seems pretty cool, but this still confuses me. Karui looked at Yugito with a bit of confusion as well. Yay Yugito. What's up? Blondie here doesn't look strong so why are you being so friendly? Yugito sighed and looked at her teammates, she then pointed at herself and then held two fingers then pointed at Naruto and held up nine fingers. This made the two girls, as well as Naruto and Shikamaru go wide-eyed. Ms. Second? Yugito looked back at Naruto who had a knowing look but also confused look as well and she smirked. That's me Mr. Ninth. Every one of the Leaf and Miss Genin were confused but Shikamaru as he saw through their code. So that girl has the nibi sealed away in her, but she looks like she has lived a normal life, maybe life for those with biju sealed in them is better over in Kumo. Well it's cool meeting someone with a similar burden as me, though not as dangerous as mine. Yugito laughed and nodded and she motioned towards her two teammates. By the way, these are my teammates and two of my few best friends, Samui Ni, my surrogate little sister, and Karui. Samui. The blonde bowed and muttered a quiet hello as she studied Naruto a bit and Karui, the dark skin, flame red haired girl smiled and waved while giving her greeting. Suddenly there was an explosion of smoke in the front of the room and everyone turned towards it as they heard a voice shout out. All right, you baby faced maggots. The first exam is about to begin, so I welcome you to your worst nightmare. The smoke revealed several chunin with clipboards and a man with scars along his face wearing a black trench coat, with dark blue, almost black button up shirt and black pants, and he wore his headband, bandana style, covering the crown of his head completely. 
Naruto smirked as he saw Ibiki. He knew who he was from when he helped Naruto mentally along with Inoichi when he was beginning to believe the villagers' words when he was four years old. He knew this was going to be an interesting test. Naruto smirked when Ibiki appeared and announced himself and he looked over at the Kiri and Kumo teams. Well, looks like things will be getting interesting now. So tell me Yugito, how are you getting along with the second? Yugito smirked. Oh, she's alright, though a bit too perverted for my taste. Naruto raised an eyebrow before chuckling, making the other genin, minus Shikamaru, even more confused. I haven't made contact with the ninth yet, but I might eventually. Yugito looked up for a second and smirked. Well the second told me to tell you this in advance, ninth is very fickle, easily pissed off by being thought of as a guy. This made Naruto and Shikamaru go wide-eyed. The Kayubi no Kitsune, the strongest of the biju, was female? Shikamaru's eyes went back to normal way before Naruto got over his shock. After all, he knew how strong a woman could be after just seeing his mother, Yoshino, Agnari, with a frying pan. Naruto nodded at Yugito, who giggled a bit. In Naruto's mindscape, the Kayubi suddenly sneezed a bit, waking her up from her nap and she looked up at the new addition to her container's mindscape. It was an extremely large curved wall with etched symbols that gave off great power, a n, a much larger version of a word wall in Skyrim. One symbol had a powerful gravitational force to it, another had wind chakra. One gave off a chill, like ice chakra, and another blazed with fire chakra. One gave off an aura of life, and the final one radiated pure spiritual energy. The Kayubi then released a red haze that covered her fox form, and when the haze lifted, a young woman appeared, she had slightly tanned skin, D cup S, long slender legs, long crimson red hair that reached her ankles. She was wearing a gray kimono that hugged her form perfectly. She had red eyes with slit pupils, nine crimson red fox tails flowing out behind her and two fox ears with white tips. She walked forward and looked at the wall closely, and suddenly a figure appeared, a figure that had on a strange set of armor that looked to be made of iron, a n, the classic appearance of the dragonborn from the commercial. Only he had a glowing aura that made him look dragon-like, a n, what the dragonborn looks like when using the dragon aspect shout. Kayubi looked at the man confused as to what the man is doing in the mindscape. The man looked back at her and walked over to the wall and began to examine it. Meanwhile outside Naruto's mindscape. Hey! Pay attention you brats, I'm about to explain the rules. The Kiri, Kumo, and Konoha Genin turned to look at Ibiki and Naruto inwardly smirked before speaking up. Hum, sorry, did you say something? This made Sasuke and Sakura face palm themselves and Ibiki to have a tick mark on his head before he chuckled. Great, we got us a mini Kakashi. I hope you don't start picking up his other habits. Naruto chuckled. Don't worry about that. You won't find me reading smut or arriving three hours late for everything. Ibiki chuckled and shook his head before glaring again. Now, I will explain the rules. All the teams will be split up and set into varying places for this written exam. Now, the test will be set on a point reduction scale. All tests will start with a perfect score of 10. For each question you get wrong you lose a single point. For every time you're caught cheating two points. Now if you want to prove your true shinobi, then prove it here and now. Oh, and one more rule, if one member of the team has their points reduced to zero, then the entire team fails. Naruto felt Sasuke and Sakura glaring at him and he simply flipped them off. Shut it Teme, Banshee, the only reason I was the dead last in the academy was because the teachers there screwed with my tests and stuff, plus I am incapable of doing the clone jutsu. Sasuke smirked. Well I guess you really are a low, it's because I have enough chakra to make the Yandaimi Hokage look like a chunin level shinobi chakra level wise. This made everyone nearby go wide eyed except for Yugido, Karui, and Samui since they knew Jinchuriki had enormous chakra levels. Sasuke was seething at how much power the blonde had and was about to demand he, Naruto, give that power to him, Sasuke. However, before he could one of the Chunin sentinels walked forward with a box and told them to grab a piece of paper telling them their seating arrangement. They went to sit down and Naruto wound up sitting next to Yugito and Kamara, who blushed a bit and waved at him, making him smile and wave at her. Yugito felt a bit of jealousy at this but recalled what the Kiri Genin, Lathan said. He was the last of his clan, which means he is able to enroll for the CRA. She shook her head at that thought. Why am I thinking that? He's practically three years younger than me. 
Oh kitten, don't deny it, you want that boy, he's got power oozing out of him and he's a handsome as well. Ooh, if I was out I'd ride him until we both passed out, in fact, that's what you should do too, we'd have a threesome, you, me and Kyubi chans container. Yugito blushed bright red but fought it down before anyone, specifically Naruto, noticed. Nibi. Shut up. Suddenly they heard Ibiki shout out for the test to begin and they started the test. Yugito quickly discovered that the questions were too hard for a normal genin to answer so she figured they had no choice but to cheat. She looked over at Naruto and saw him thinking, before he started looking around the room though it was only his eyes that moved and she saw that he figured out that he needed to cheat as well, she even heard him whisper something before Nibi claimed to feel a great power within whatever he said, and Yugito figured it to be a unique jutsu. During the 45 minutes, several dozen teams out of the hundreds of teams there were called out and dismissed from the exams for cheating. After the 45 minutes were up, Ibiki spoke out. Alright, now, it's time for the final question, but first, there are some extra rules that need to be explained. This got many shouts in anger and irritation, which Ibiki cut off. The first rule is you may choose to take this last question. Many people looked confused, and Tamari voiced it out. What would happen if we chose not to take this question? Ibiki smirked. Then your score along with your teammates will be reduced to zero and you will fail. Then of course we'll take it. Kiba yelled, making Ibiki laugh. You didn't let me finish, if you choose to take it and get it wrong you will be barred from taking the Chunin exams ever again. The got shouts of outrage. What? That's not fair. There are plenty of people here who've taken the exam before. Ibiki smirked. Well, you were unfortunate to get me as the proctor this year. My exam, my rules. So whoever doesn't feel up to the task, raise your hand so we can take your number and escort you out. He began to wait and smirk as several people shakily raised their hands and they, along with their teams, were escorted out of the room. Naruto narrowed his eyes at Ibiki before smirking and he tapped Yugito and Kamara on the shoulders, getting their attention. I know Ibiki, he's just trying to mind us, stay in the exam. The two girls nodded, a bit skeptical, and curious as to how he knows the proctor and when several more people quit, leaving only 26 teams, Naruto sighed and slammed his hand on his desk. Oh will you people stop being such cowards? Seriously, you guys aren't worthy to be shinobi if you're afraid to take a stupid question. Ibiki looked at Naruto and smirked. It seems the kid's finally coming out with his true talent, a bit later than me and Inoichi suggested, but better late than never. So you think you've got the GTS to take this question kid? Naruto smirked. Damn straight. Bring it on, I'll take that question no problem. Ibiki looked around and saw people had gotten a boost of confidence from the blonde's rant. Well, prolonging this is now pointless. Guess we have our contestants. So, you're all going to risk it? At seeing no one back down he smirked. Very well. For all of you who stayed, I have one thing to say to you all. You all. Pass. There was a stunned silence and shouts of confusion. Ibiki then explained that the test was a test of information gathering while the last question was a test of resolve. He then explained that information was a very important tool and that interrogation was useful but also deadly if the information was wrong. He took of his headband, showing the scars and puncture wounds on his bald skull, showing he had been tortured several times at least. As he was about to continue, a black ball shot through the window and unfurled showing a woman with purple hair in a ponytail like Shikamaru. The ball unfurled and stuck in the roof, turning into a banner that stated. Proctor for the second exam. The Y and single Anko Mitarashi. Anko smirked and held an arm up. All right you maggots, follow me to the area of the second exam. Many people sweat dropped and Naruto facepalmed, making Kamara and Yugito look at him in confusion. Then Ibiki moved the side of the banner and sighed. Anko, you're early. Again. Anko looked back at him and then had a sheepish look before counting the teams left. 78. What the hell Ibiki, you left 26 teams? Are you getting soft old man? Ibiki smirked. Maybe we've got a tougher batch, one in particular, I think you're familiar with. Ibiki tilted his head towards the crowd, and Anko looked through before she saw Naruto and waved, smirking. Hey, Foxy Kun. How've you been? This made many people look at Naruto who sighed and facepalmed himself again before waving slightly. Hey Anko, I'm alright, and you? Anko nodded, I'm good, especially since I get to take these other genin to my little playground. 
Naruto went pale when she said that. Oh Kami, not there. Everyone who didn't know Anko looked confused, and Yugito and Kamara looked at him and asked at exactly the same time. Where is her, playground? Naruto shook his head and shuddered a bit. You'll find out soon enough, I've been there before, and I don't really want to talk about it. This got Yugito and Kamara worried along with a few who heard him, but Anko simply laughed. All right you maggots, go to training ground 44 for the next stage of the Chunin exams, if you aren't there in 30 minutes, then you'll be disqualified, and don't worry about the numbers Ibiki, when I'm through with them, the number will be cut in half. This made everyone nervous as they made their way to the training ground. When they rookies, the Kumo team, and the Kiri team made it there, they turned to see Naruto was still pale and shuddering at the SGHT of the fenced off forest and Sasuke was confused since he never saw Naruto this afraid and it made him slightly worried about the forest himself. Suddenly Anko appeared in front of the crowd after 30 minutes and she smirked. All right kiddies, welcome to training ground 44, or as we like to call it, the forest of death. Anko smirked as she looked around and she saw Naruto and smirked at how he looked at the forest nervously, she shrugged then spoke up. All right everyone, listen up, the 30 minutes are up so whoever is missing a teammate, get lost, you're disqualified for the whole team not being here. This made a few teams grumble, annoyed that their teammate got lost as they turned and left, leaving 24 teams and Anko spoke out again, getting everyone's attention. All right, everyone listen up, this part of the exam will be an all-out combat and survival simulation, but that's not all. Anko pulled out two scrolls from her trench coat and held them up, they were similar but one was brown with the kanji for earth, and the other white with the kanji for heaven, and Anko then continued. This exam is also a collection exam, in order to pass, your whole team must collect both a heaven scroll and an earth scroll and bring it to the tower at the center of the training ground, half of you will receive an earth scroll and the other half will get the heaven scroll. This made many realize that Anko was serious about what she had said before, at the least, half of them would be taken out of the exam. Now. The test has a time limit, a total of 5 days you must survive within the forest and make it to the tower. 5 days? What'll we do for food? Anko looked at Choji, who was shocked at how long they were spending in the training ground. There are plenty of things to eat within the forest, plants, animals, but beware because sometimes the prey might turn into the predator. Also I forgot to mention one rule, you must not open the scrolls until you reach the tower, that will not be pleasant for the idiots who attempt this. Why not? Anko sighed and looked around, it's simple really, sometimes a shinobi will be tasked with carrying and delivering sensitive documents, this will test your will as well as your survival skills. Many nodded as that made sense and Anko looked at a nearby clock and again pulled something out of her trench coat, a stack of paper. Alright, now I need everyone to sign these forms, they are to show that you're doing this willingly and that if you die Konoha won't be held responsible. This made many nervous until Anko called out. Hey Foxy Kun, mind passing these out for me? Naruto looked annoyed. Why do I have to do it? Get someone else. Anko's response was to throw a kunai, which Naruto caught and twirled and held behind him, against the stomach of Anko, who'd shunshine behind him with a kunai that she held at his neck. Ah, come on Foxy Kun, do it for me? Anko ed up a bit of the blood that dripped from Naruto's already healing cut, making Kamara, Yugito, Hanada, and strangely enough Samui and Ino jealous. Naruto sighed and dropped the kanai. Fine, give them to me and I'll pass the stupid forms out. Anko looked happy and handed him the sheets. Thanks Foxy Kun. You're never gonna stop calling me that, are you? His response was for Anko to smile even more and laugh. I thought not. Naruto went around and handed out the forms and once they signed it, a stand with a curtain was set up and the teams turned in their forms and received their scroll out of sight of the other teams. Team 7 got a heaven scroll. Once all of the teams got their scrolls they went to random entrance gates and waited for the exam to begin. After a few minutes of waiting the gates opened and the speakers blared as Anko shouted out for the exams to begin. Everyone ran into the forest and the second exam had begun. With Team 7. Naruto was behind Sasuke with Sakura beside him as they raced through the forest to find a safe spot, then Naruto stopped, claiming he had to go to the bathroom and he walked away. He later returned but Sasuke saw it was not Naruto but an imposter, an AIM Genin. They were about to attack when Naruto jumped down and landed a drop kick on the AIM Nin's head, knocking him unconscious. Well that was easy. 
Sasuke simply looked annoyed and grunted before turning away as Naruto searched for a scroll, only to find he didn't have it and decided they needed a password to identify each other so they decided on a phrase. Naruto decided to play along at not being able to remember it since he sensed a dark chakra nearby and he sighed and nodded to the phrase. After a while of traveling again, Naruto was blown away by a wind style. Great breakthrough. He landed a few hundred feet away and turned to see a large snake coming down at him. Naruto growled and took a deep breath. Y'all. As he shouted that, a large but short burst of flame flew out of his mouth and hit the snake dead on in the face making it distracted and lose concentration, which caused it to impale itself on a sharp branch. However, what surprised Naruto was that rather than dying, it vanished in a puff of smoke, showing it was a summon and Naruto was shocked before he looked around and began to move when he felt a familiar pull, and he traveled along until he saw yet another word wall, and when he approached he saw a dragon tangling with yet another enormous snake and the snake bit the dragon and injected poison but the snake was dispelled when Naruto threw a kanai into its eye. The dragon looked at Naruto and growled before it breathed a stream of ice at him, he in turn used his fire breath to counter and he jumped forward and threw a kanai with an exploding tag down the dragon's throat as it roared and when it detonated the dragon was decapitated. He watched as the dragon disintegrated and he felt the soul being absorbed, making him smirk as he walked forward to loot the bones of the dead dragon, he found several hundred yen, a few kanai, and strangely enough, a kusarigama. He picked up the weapon and spun the weighted end a bit before he sealed it in a scroll he bought from a weapons shop that treated him fairly. He looked up at the wall and he walked up to the wall and he smirked as the chanting grew and he looked up as a word near the top of the wall revealed itself. Death. Naruto turned and looked around before a ten foot long centipede appeared and Naruto took a deep breath. Keen. A purple pulse was released and it hit the large insect. The insect had a deathly purple aura and it looked to be in pain before the glow died along with the insect. Nice. Marked for death in the forest of death. Beware my power you asses. Naruto ran forward trying to find his teammates. Meanwhile with Sasuke, Sakura, and Orochimaru, A, N. We all know it's him so I'll skip over him revealing himself. Sasuke was kneeling, exhausted from fighting the disguised Orochimaru. Sakura had been backhanded and knocked out when she hit a tree. Sasuke looked up and growled but his face went to a shocked expression when he saw the Kusa Nin's face again. Rather than a slightly tanned woman it was a pale-skinned man with sickly yellow eyes and purple mascara. The man smirked and covered his headband, when he removed his hand, rather than the Kusa symbol, the auto symbol was shown. The man then chuckled and he stood up straight. Well, it appears you are strong Sasuke-kun, but at this point you're nowhere near strong enough to kill Itachi. Sasuke stiffened and looked up in shock and rage. You know Itachi? Where is he? The man simply chuckled again. It does not matter where his is at the moment, you couldn't defeat him as you are now, but allow me to give you a parting gift, to show you the power that I, Orochimaru of the Sanin, can offer you. Orochimaru made a hand sign and his neck stretched up and over to where Sasuke was and bit his neck. Sasuke shouted in pain and when Orochimaru pulled his head back, a mark had formed in the form of three circling Tomo, it was the curse mark. At this point Sakura had woken up and shouted at Orochimaru. You bastard. What did you do to Sasuke-kun? Orochimaru simply chuckled again. I simply gave him a taste of the power I can offer him, soon, he will come to me for more, and nothing will stop this from happening. As Orochimaru was speaking, he was melting into the tree branch he was on. Soon he was gone leaving a now unconscious Sasuke and a frantic Sakura. Sakura picked Sasuke up and leapt off the branch they were on and began searching for shelter. A few hours later, Sakura was sitting outside of a hollow of a tree where Sasuke was lying. She had spent most of the night trying to ease his pain and now he was just resting, still unconscious. She had set up traps and was now keeping watch, but due to her dieting and taking care of her looks rather than training, she was soon exhausted and fighting sleep. Up in the trees were the three Otto Nin. Dosu, Zaku, and Kin. A. N. I don't feel like describing them since you already know what they look like were under orders from the leader of Otto, Orochimaru to kill Sasuke Uchiha, but they didn't know about Orochimaru's attack on them. Dosu was observing them closely and Kin pointed something out. Where's the blonde guy at? Zaku scoffed, who cares, let's just get this over with, I want to tear that Uchiha apart. Zaku grinned maniacally, Dosu however sighed and shook his head. Easy Zaku, 
That girl may look asleep, but we should be careful, she might have set up a trap. Zaku scoffed but nodded. A few minutes later, Sakura was still fighting sleep when she saw a squirrel running towards her and she gasped and threw a kanai which scared it and made it turn away before it ran off. In the bush Zaku wondered if they saw the exploding tag on the squirrel's back but Dosu was convinced it was something else. A few more minutes later, the auto nin jumped down from the tree. Sakura went alert and pulled out a kanai as the auto nin stepped forward, but when they reached a certain point, Dosu stopped them and knelt down, examining the grass and he chuckled. Recently disturbed dirt, and grass that looks like it doesn't belong in this part of the forest. What a poor excuse of a trap. Sakura just smirked and threw the kanai behind her and cut a wire which released a large log that swung down at them, however Zaku simply smirked and lifted his arm and pointed his palm at it. Suddenly a blast of wind shot out of a hole in his palm and destroyed the log entirely, making Sakura gasp in surprise and Zaku smirked. Please, you think we're weak? Don't be stupid you. Zaku, calm down, we're just going to carry out our mission, no need to draw out other competitors to make it harder than needed. Zaku smirked at Dosu. Ha! I don't care. If I get to fight more, then I'll just have more fun. Dosu sighed and shook his head before glancing at Sakura and he put back the sleeve and showed the device on his right arm. A. N. Fight is pretty much same as the cannon, even when Lee gets there and Sasuke wakes up. Sasuke walked forward, the dark chakra pouring off and surrounding him making him look insane and he looked at her. Sakura, who did this to you? Dosu was as pale as the bandages around him and he was about to shout out a retreat when Zaku decided to be an idiot. That would be me. What are you gonna do about it? Sasuke glared at Zaku and Dosu knew they had to run or they would die here and now. Zaku. Don't fight, we have to retreat now. Zaku laughed. What are you scared of a half-dead punk for Dosu? I'll take him out in one shot. Zaku raised both arms but before he could do anything, Sasuke was in front of him and had grabbed Zaku's arms, twisted them so they broke and threw him at a nearby tree. He turned on Kin, who was released by Ino and she looked scared seeing Sasuke smirk at her, showing what he wanted as he eyed her body from a distance. However, a booming sound was heard and Naruto shot into view above them as they heard him shout. Wold. Naruto dropped and landed in front of Sasuke and narrowed his eyes at the Uchiha. Teme. I saw the way you were looking at that girl, don't even think about it. Sasuke smirked and laughed. What makes you think you can stop me, Dobi? I'm an Uchiha and with this power I'm so far above unstoppable, I might as well be a god. Naruto sighed and looked at the crazed Uchiha as he went through hand signs. Sasuke finished them and shouted out. Fire style. Grand fireball jutsu. Naruto simply rolled his eyes. Let's see whose fire burns hotter, shall we? Y'all. Naruto shot out a small but wide stream of fire that was a few feet long when it left his mouth and it crashed into the Uchiha's jutsu, overpowering it and it traveled d farther before the Uchiha dodged. What? How the hell are you so strong Dobi? Answer me. Naruto rolled his eyes again. Because, I fight, not for myself, but those I consider precious, you fight for yourself and consider others to be weak and not worth your time. It's like Kakashi sensei said, Konoha is strong because of our teamwork, not because of the individuals in the village. Sasuke scoffed and charged forward but Naruto dodged and kicked his side. Sasuke, however, got back up and vanished before appearing behind Naruto and kicking him. Naruto flew over and hit one of the many trees and he fell to the ground groaning. Sasuke smirked as he looked at the blonde. See you loser? I told you I might as well be a god. No one can beat me. Sasuke turned back to everyone in the clearing and smirked at them when suddenly. No one? I think you put too much faith in your clan name. Everyone looked over at Naruto to see him with a glowing aura around him. What, how can you be still standing? And what is that power? It should be mine, give it to me. Naruto scoffed. This boy's power is his alone, none other can bear the power, the souls, of the dragons. Nearby Neji narrowed his eyes. You speak as if you aren't that blonde loser. Naruto laughed. I guess you could say I'm his inner spirit. I have only just awakened but I will be guiding this young one in learning to control his thuim. I will lead this child to become a legend, one not seen for millennia. He will be the next Dovican, the savior of this world and none shall match his strength, not even the one with the red eyes there will be even close to gaining this power. I don't need a weak power like that. I'm an Uchiha, 
I cannot be beaten. Naruto, laughed once again. Yet moments ago you demanded this power, the power I myself once wielded, for your own selfish desires. I may have only awakened but I was still aware of Naruto's surroundings as well as the souls of those around the boy. Your soul is falling into darkness, never to see the light. I sense you would become a threat to this child if you believed he was stronger than you. Oh please like that loser would be stronger than me. He's a weak, pathetic, clanless loser who's not worthy of ing the ground I waga. Sasuke was kicked back and landed next to a shocked Sakura and, Naruto, walked forward and grabbed him by the neck before lifting him up, which is a surprise considering Naruto was shorter than Sasuke. Don't be a fool. Naruto is only weak because this village hinders him, purposefully I might add. This made many people raise their eyebrows in confusion, minus Shikamaru, Choji, and Ino. A recently arrived Tenten was thinking hard on this. Why would Konoha try and hinder the growth of one of their shinobi? We need all of the strongest shinobi we can get in order to get as many jobs and ward off any thoughts of invasion as possible. In case you are all curious, I suggest you ask your leader, he can tell you all why, but I will say this, think of the day and month Naruto was born, his age, and anything that has to do with that and add in the reason why all but a few people of this village, despise this child. Tenten nodded without realizing it, just wanting to get to the bottom of the situation, though she had no idea why but just figured it was her finding out a way to help a fellow Konoha shinobi. Now you child, you will listen and listen close, if you attack Naruto with the intent to kill him again, I will personally tear you apart, clan name be damned, do you understand? Naruto, squeezed a bit harder. F fine, I I won't attack T the Dobi. Naruto, nodded before the aura dispelled and Naruto fell over unconscious, dropping Sasuke as well. Sasuke dropped to the forest floor, his curse mark fading, coughing and Naruto groaned as he woke up. Ah! Uh, w what the? What's going on? Sakura was in shock and couldn't respond so Tenten sighed and spoke up. Apparently you were possessed by someone or something and you pretty much kicked that guy's ass before warning him not to be a threat. Naruto nodded with a confused expression. I I see. Naruto stood up slowly and shook his head, then he looked over at Sasuke and saw the last of the curse mark fading back into the triple tomo seal on the back of his neck close to where his neck meets his right shoulder. Naruto shook his head again and looked over at everyone else and saw Neji watching him with suspicion in his eyes. Naruto looked over at Sakura and saw that she ran over to Sasuke and was checking over him and Naruto groaned before rubbing his side, where Sasuke kicked him and he lifted the jacket and his shirt to see a bruise that was already healing. Tenten, who had started waking Lee up saw him and she frowned a bit at what appeared to be a scar from a sword, but she didn't dwell on it very long before she noticed that his bruise was healing much faster than it should. Must be a bloodline he doesn't know about or something. Tenten thought to herself, then she noticed the muscles on him and blushed a bit before turning back to her still unconscious teammate and resumed her attempts to wake him up gently. By shaking him hard and giving him a few slaps that left marks on his cheeks, Naruto saw that and sweat dropped, before looking at Neji again and raised an eyebrow. Same eyes as Hanada. Hey why are you staring at me? Neji remained silent as Tenten looked up at them as Lee slowly woke up. Naruto had a tick mark on his head. Oi. Stop ignoring me and answer my question. Neji scoffed and turned around before starting to walk away and calling to his teammates. Tenten, Lee, we're leaving. The two nodded but before leaving Tenten gave one last glance back at Naruto before she leapt into the trees with her teammates and left. Naruto rolled his neck as he and his team stood in the middle of a clearing surrounded by Aim Genin who were using clones and Naruto smirked as he made his, in, famous hand sign before calling out. Shadow Clone Jutsu. Suddenly over 50 clones of Naruto appeared and began fighting the AIM Nin clones. Meanwhile Naruto looked over and saw a recent addition to their group, Kabuto Yakushi, fighting alongside him and his squad. They had been traveling for a full day and the exam was almost over. Naruto pulled out a kunai as he leapt into the fight with his clones. Sasuke used his fireball jutsu to deal with some clones that either beat Naruto's PR simply got around them. Kabuto was using a strangely curved kunai to cut down any clones near him and Sakura was farther back cheering on Sasuke. However as this was going on something interesting was happening inside of Naruto's seal. Naruto's seal. The Kayubi was intrigued by the one who saved her host from dying, though she couldn't hear what was said due to the restrictions of her seal, all she knew was that he made her container move while she healed him, 
and she walked to the bars, which had shifted in size with her, and looked at the armor-wearing man who was meditating in front of the strange wall that appeared in the boy's mindscape. Who are you? The man opened his eyes and looked at her, his eyes glowing with power that she didn't recognize and he slowly stood up before walking to the bars of her cage and stared for a moment. My name has long since been lost to time. As a result you may simply refer to me as Krent Goal, Shattered, Broken Stone. Who are you? Kayubi narrowed her eyes slightly. My name is not for you to know, you may refer to me by my given title, Kayubi. The warrior nodded before looking at the cage. You are a prisoner in the soul of this boy. Why? Kayubi growled, sounding more like her bestial form rather than her human form. A bastard of a human tricked me and as a result I wound up sealed in a weak human child. This child is far from weak, and he has earned the blessing of a Daedric goddess, something very few ever earn. Kayubi looked confused. A Daedric goddess? What is that? The only goddesses and gods here are Kami, Yami, Shinigami, Suzano and many others, but they never call themselves Daedric. That is because these are demonic gods and goddesses, but while most are evil, a few are not. Krent begins to tell Kayubi of the world before the Biju, when the elemental nations were different and Chakra did not exist. Inside the tower. Sasuke looked at Aruka as they walked into the tower from the room they were in and Aruka led them to the main arena where multiple teams were standing in a series of lines in the middle of the arena. At the back of the arena was a large stone carved into two hands making the ram hand sign. In front of the statue were a few people, the Hokage, two Anbu, Anko Mitarashi, and Ibiki Morino from the first exam who were looking over everyone. Hiruzen looked over at them and smiled slightly at Naruto and Aldora, who smiled back before they got serious and the three got into the formation with the rest of the genin. The genin who made it were the Auto genin, the Suna team, a team from AIM, the Kiri team, and five Konoha genin teams. Hiruzen looks around and nods to a few chunin who close the doors behind Uruka and Team 7. Now, congratulations to all who have passed this exam. However, a few things need to be explained about the next exam. Hiruzen began to explain the exam's purpose and about how the third exam would be different from the previous ones in that it will be a tournament-style exam that, unlike the others, features two-on-two -two matches rather than one-on-one. -on -one. After that he asked if a anyone would want to forfeit early, which Kabuto did, claiming he was suffering from chakra exhaustion. Soon after, a sickly-looking janin appears before the Hokage, a box in hand and he walked over to the rows of genin and holds the box up, a, n. I will mark places where Hayate coughs with this. Forgive me for interrupting. My name is Hayate Giko, proctor for the third exam. Now, everyone here will pick a card in this box and they will determine who your teammate is and then we wi. We will randomize the order of the fights, so you will not know who you will fight until the week before the match. The card is for. For you to keep because exactly one week before the final exam we will send out special messenger hawks that are attracted to the scent that is embedded in the cards. Kiba tilted his head slightly. So that's what that smell is? I was wondering what smelled so weird. Hayate nodded. That's right, as an in Inazuka, you would be able smell it as well. The cards were crafted from the trees just outside the walls of Konoha but we embedded some of the feed we used to train the birds in them to make them easier to track. Kiba and others nod before Hayate moves around with the box and everyone grabs a small card from it at random. Hayate stepped back and looked across and nodded. Alright, now I want you to each call out the number on your card, one at a time. The genin looked at their cards and called out. Lathan and Neji, 2, Gara and Lewis, 6, Kamara and Naruto, 9. Yugito and Hanada, 3, Kiba and Yoroi, 7, Zaku and Kin, 5. Dosu and Choji, 11, Sasuke and Tamari, 8, Samui and Konkuro, 10. Karui and Tenten, 1, Shino and Sakura, 4, Ino and Masumi, 12. Hayate nodded as each person spoke and wrote down the teams before moving back up to the Hokage and handing him the list. Hiruzen looked over the list carefully and nodded. Very well. Now, from this moment on the second exam is finished. The final exam however will take place in a month, during this time you will need to train and develop strategies with your new teammates. This month-long wait is also for giving the dignitaries and daimyos of various nations as well as the mizukage and the rakage time to travel here to Konoha. Now be sure to train hard and do your best to represent your villages and show the strengths of your villages. Naruto walked onto the training field that he and Kamara were assigned to use. 
He saw Kamara Whitig for him and he smiled as he walked over, waving. Hey Kamara. Kamara smiled slightly at him and walked forward. About time you got here, I thought you forgot about little old me. Naruto chuckled and shook his head. Don't be ridiculous, we've trained together for a week now, so I don't think I'll forget you anytime soon. Kamara blushed a bit at that but shook her head slightly and giggled before she walked forward and, shrugging one sleeve of her battle kimono off her shoulder, activated her keke jenke and made a bone sword appear. Naruto had learned a bit of her keke jenke while they trained, apparently the Kagaya clan had an excess amount of calcium in their bones that they used to create their bone weapons. However, many Kagaya go past their limit and use so much calcium from their bones that their keke jenke begins to draw the needed calcium from another source, their internal organs. This caused a disease to spread amongst the clan and assisted in wiping most of them out, very few survived the bloodline wars of Kiri, and even fewer still survived the disease that spread during that battle. The few that did survive were members that either did not gain the keke jenke or were the more sane, and reasonable members of the clan who did not desire to fight. Naruto pulled his Uzumaki sword off of his back in response to Kamara creating her sword. The sword felt comfortable being wielded by his hand, despite him never having touched a sword in his life before that time. He stood in the basic stance taught to him by Tenten and began to allow his instincts to take over. Tenten had told him that if the sword was meant for him, his instincts would know how to use it. And when Tenten found out the unique sword and scaled armor being made were his, she immediately begged him to find more of the materials to make more weapons of it, to which Naruto agreed with a massive sweat drop on the back of his head. Naruto swung the sword instinctively, parrying one of Kamara's strikes. They began focusing on the fight at hand rather than what had been on their individual minds before the first strike. The sound of clashing was heard throughout the training area and Naruto moved back making Kamara miss an overhead swing. Naruto then moved forward and was about to put his sword at her throat when she made a spike rise from her palm and she blocked his blade. They separated and after a few seconds, rushed towards each other, clashing swords and spikes against each other. This continued for several minutes, with neither gaining an edge before that ended up in a draw with Naruto holding the wrist her spike was on in a sword at her throat and Kamara with her sword at his throat. They were breathing heavily and after staring each other in the eye for a few seconds, they separated and Naruto sheathed his weapons while Kamara retracted the spike and began to absorb the bone sword back into her body in order to prevent the loss of the calcium used in making it. Well Naruto-kun, that was an intense spar. Naruto laughed and nodded. Yay. You're very good Kamara-chan. I think I've got your style down, so it'll be easier to fight alongside you now. Kamara nodded, smiling as well. Same here, though your style is more difficult, you're mostly random but you can adapt to nearly any situation. Naruto chuckled and nodded. After discussing, and practicing, some plans and strategies they could use in the future they decided to call it a day and headed back into the Konoha market district to get something to eat. Naruto suggested a few places, Ichiraku being the first one, and Kamara relented after Naruto suggested Ichiraku a third time and giggled when he smiled. They arrived at the stand and after Tuchi took their order, they began talking. Soon, Ayame came out and after a quick, inquisitive look at Kamara, served them their food. Ayame stuck around and chatted with them. After eating, Kamara clung to Naruto's arm to try and make Ayame jealous, since she figured out she, Ayame, felt the same way about Naruto. But to her surprise, Ayame, when Naruto was distracted by his ramen, simply held out a sheet of paper and when Kamara read it, she blushed a bit but nodded. She had forgotten about the CRA that Naruto could be a member of, and she hoped he would, she finally admitted to herself a few days ago that she did have feeling for Naruto, and training with him only made those feelings grow stronger as she got to know him. She shook her head to clear these thoughts and simply clung to his arm as they walked through the village. Eventually they reached Kamara's team's hotel and after they said goodbye, Kamara thought for a brief second before ing Naruto's cheek and winking before walking quickly into the hotel, blushing. Naruto blushed a bit before smiling slightly and walked back to his apartment. Near Naruto's apartment. A swirling vortex of purple energy formed near Naruto's apartment complex, and suddenly a woman wearing unusual green, gray and tan armor was seemingly pushed from the Daedric portal. The woman got up and, eyes widening, ran back towards the portal, unaware that she was de-aging to the size of a 14-year-old girl. No, Lord Hercini, please, allow me back into your hunting grounds. She was stopped by a massive, spectral bear. 
No Ayla. As much as I enjoy watching you hunt, it appears that new hunters and prey are arriving, and as my favorite hunter, I command you to live your new life in Mundas once again to learn new techniques to entertain me. The world has changed in the last ten millennia so you will need to learn to adapt as a true hunter would. Now go. Learn and when you finally return to my embrace, you will be far superior to your current self. Oh, and before I forget, I have reversed your age so you may grow as you train. Ayla was wide-eyed at the Daedric Lord's words before kneeling with her head bowed. Why yes Lord Hercini, I understand and will obey. Good, as a gesture of faith, I grant you the beast blood that you possessed in your previous life. I also grant you my savior's hide and my ring, as they will grant you strength in your new life. Suddenly a smaller vortex of energy was revealed in a small white ring with a ruby-eyed wolf's head appeared next to a set of unusual leather armor, a, n. The savior's hide daedric artifact with forsworn boots, helm, and gauntlets, all enchanted. Ayla accepted these and changed quickly. After she had changed she looked expectantly at the vortex. No Ayla, you will not receive your weapons from my realm, they are safe and hidden, but you will use the weapons used by this world from now on. You will adapt, you will hunt, and you will become my huntress if you succeed in this new world. Ayla went wide-eyed again before kneeling in awe. To be her scene's huntsman or huntress was a great honor, you were given the right to hunt in many worlds and bring the greatest trophies to Hercini himself. Very few were ever given this honor. Lord Hercini, I thank you for this opportunity, I will do you proud and become the greatest huntress to serve under you. The spectral bear nodded before it seemed to smirk and began to slowly fade along with the vortex behind it, but not before leaving some parting words that surprised her. Also, I expect you to begin the next generation of hunters in Mundas again. My followers have all passed on and we are not worshipped in these lands anymore. So bring about a new generation of followers, in any way you can. Show the world the glory of my hunting grounds. Oh, and watch for the one favored by Azura, he may be helpful in your quest, and may be a potential mate for you. From what I can sense, he is quite the fox when it comes to fighting, clever, quick, and unpredictable. He could be a most dangerous hunter if he chose to be. Ayla nodded as her chini fatted. Ayla stood up before a fox-like scent caught her attention. She turned and saw a boy, who looked around her, now younger self's, age. The looked at her and she looked back at him before he looked at the armor and went wide-eyed. A follower of Hercini? Ayla went wide-eyed once again, this boy knew of Hercini? The people of Mundas were supposed to have forgotten the gods and goddesses as well as the Daedra, could he? If your master sent you to hunt, do it outside of this village. I will not tolerate it if harm came to these people of this village. Ayla blinked and shook her head. No, Lord Hercini sent me here to learn the ways of the new world. He also said to find the follower of Azura, for he may help me learn and become stronger, as well as find new followers for Hercini. The boy narrowed his eyes and closed them while sighing. Very well, so who are you, Hunter? Ayla held her head high. I am Ayla, and you are? Naruto Uzumaki. Ayla tilted her head slightly. A most unusual name. Well, you've more than likely been in her scene's hunting grounds for a few millennia, so you wouldn't know of how times change. Ayla thought for a moment and nodded. You do have a point. According to Lord Hercini, I have been in his hunting grounds for ten millennia. Naruto went wide-eyed and whistled. Damn, that's a long time, in fact I think ten millennia was when the last Dovacan was around. Ayla looked up. Yes. I remember him, though, unfortunately, not his name. It's been so long that I couldn't remember it even though he was the harbinger of the companions before my time came and I was accepted into the hunting grounds. Naruto looked at Ayla in surprise, then smiled brightly. Wait, you were a companion? Cool, I'm meeting one of the original members of the companions from the previous Dovacan's time. Naruto smiled brightly and Ayla blushed a bit before his words registered to her and she raised her eyebrows in surprise. Previous Dovican? Does that mean you are the new Dovican of this time? Naruto nodded. Yep. You're looking at the most recent, as well as the first, Dovican of the Shinobi world. Ayla tilted her head curiously. Shinobi? Naruto chuckled at her expression, it was cute. Yes, Shinobi, we are warriors who cling to the shadows, or we used to, then we started getting the idea that warriors of shadows belong in the light so everyone can see our weak points. Very few stick to the true shinobi way. Unfortunately, as the Dovican, I also fall into that category, but I mix my fighting styles with both obvious and not so obvious fighting styles. 
Ayla nodded and she looked around. I will need somewhere to stay, since I am new to this world, I need housing. Naruto chuckled and held out his hand. You can come stay at my apartment complex. It's basically like an inn but it is made up of multiple, small homes capable of housing two or three people comfortably. While you're there, I can explain how the world has changed since the last you were here. Ayla raised an eyebrow and crossed her arms under her now smaller bust. Why is it you seem to trust me so suddenly? We have just met, do I not cause you to be suspicious? Naruto shook his head. Not in the slightest. I'm a great judge of character. I can usually tell a good person from a cruel person and I can tell that you are a kind, honorable person with great strength. Ayla was wide-eyed with a slight blush, he really sees that in her? She was now very curious about the boy she had just met. She nodded and the two began walking up the stairs of the large building behind them. As they walked up the stairs to the top floor, Naruto was informing Ayla of the changes the world had gone through. Elves had left the lands along with the Khajiit and Argonians for unknown reasons and had long since been forgotten. Suddenly a loud sound similar to crashing thunder was heard, it was the same as Naruto had heard some time ago. Dovican. Ayla looked up in surprise, the Greybeards, they summon you Naruto. Naruto looked over at Ayla as he unlocked his front door and allowed Ayla to enter his apartment before him so he could close the door behind them. The Greybeards? Who are they? Ayla looked around the room and nodded at the size of the apartment room. They are masters of the way of the voice. They meditate, study, and train for years to learn the Thuam, the voice of the dragons. However, they are extraordinarily passive, nearly never involving themselves in the matters of the world below their mountaintop castle. Naruto raised an eyebrow but shrugged and continued to explain the state of what was once Skyrim. As they sat in Naruto's living room Ayla nodded and looked up at him. So Magicka has been replaced with this, Chakra was it? Naruto nods and Ayla continues, so Chakra is the energy within all people and no one can live without it. It was granted to humanity by a man with godlike abilities you called the Rikudo Senen. And this man defeated an enormous demon with ten tails and split it into nine separate, Biju, and the battle with this ten-tailed demon caused a dramatic change in the entire landscape of Skyrim so it looks like it does today. Naruto nodded again. Yay. Back then I think Magicka still existed but due to the Jubi wiping out most mages, and altering the very environment with its trails of destruction, Magicka was slowly used less and less until Chakra came into the world and took its place. Though, just because something isn't used, I don't believe it is lost. In order to test my theory, however, I would need to find a spell tome. Unfortunately, due to how long it has been, they are either locked away as historical artifacts or possibly decayed beyond use. Ayla nodded at his words before she reached into her pouch and pulled out a book that had a strange symbol, the Oblivion Gate symbol for conjuration spells, and held it out for Naruto to see. Would this work? Naruto was wide-eyed, before he grabbed it. No way, a genuine spell tome, did you have this on you the entire time? Ayla nodded. That spell tome is for the Conjure Flame Thrall spell. If you are powerful enough, you can conjure a flame Atronach that will follow you until its death. Naruto looked astounded and he contemplated whether he should learn the spell or wait. He set the book in his lap, crossed his arms, closed his eyes, and began to think. Ayla was curious to see what he would do. That spell tome was the only one she had on her. She had obtained it just before her death from looting the corpse of a Thalmor who attempted to murder, and steal the spell tomes of, Finnis Gestor, the expert level conjuration mage, it was actually shortly after that that another Thalmor agent snuck up behind her as she was putting the book in the bag to return to Finnis, and the Thalmor slit her throat and stabbed her in the heart as she fell to the ground. She was brought out of her musings of the past to see Naruto open his eyes, he picks up the book and opens it. After reading the first page, the book vanishes and Naruto closes his eyes, memorizing what he needed to do to cast the conjuration spell. Naruto stood up and walked outside before motioning Ayla to follow him. She stood up and did so and they left the apartment complex and went to one of the many training grounds. Training Ground 20. Naruto and Ayla arrived at an empty training ground and Ayla looked around in approval of the area. Naruto took a step forward and took a deep breath. Alright, time to test and see if my theory is correct. Naruto held up one hand and concentrated for a few seconds before his hand cupped and he held a small daedric portal in his hand, a sign that he was about to use a conjuration spell. 
Naruto clenched his hand slightly and breathed deeply before pushing the spell hand out and a large daedric vortex appeared. The vortex vanished and in its place was what appeared to be a beautiful woman made entirely of fire and stone. However, Ayla noticed a few things that were off with this flame Atronach. Rather than the two antlers on her head, it had what appeared to be a crown of some sort and the flames didn't go upwards but flowed down its back as if it was hair. The Atronach looked around and then at Naruto who was surprised. Naruto and Ayla stared at the Atronach in surprise as she levitated in front of the two, a small fire lit under her feet. Ayla spoke up first. That should be impossible. Flame Atronachs cannot speak. Not in the human tongue. The Atronach tilted her head. Forgive me, but I am no mere Atronach. I am Fiera, Queen of the Flame Thrall and Flame Atronox. Which of you summoned me? Naruto raised an arm. I never thought I would see a Flame Atronach, let alone the Queen of their race. This is so cool. Oh, um, welcome to Konoha. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, and I am the one who summoned you. You're in the land once known as Skyrim. Though several centuries ago, the land had changed after a demon appeared and began destroying the land, altering its appearance with its power. Now it is simply known as the Elemental Nations, this country is known as Hai no Kuni, or the Land of Fire in the Old Tongue. Fiera nodded and looked at Naruto closely before she seemed to smile. Hum, you are a most handsome human. I thank you for summoning me, and I will allow you to call forth myself at any time for half of the magicka you used to summon me tonight. Consider it a gift for being the one to summon me. She smiled a bit more and brushed a hand against Naruto's cheek, making him jump before he realized that she did not burn him. I look forward to seeing you again, master. She purred the last word and faded from view as she dispelled herself from Naruto and Ayla's plane. Naruto blushed a bit and Ayla seemed strangely jealous of the Atronach queen, but shook it off with a bit of confusion. She looked at Naruto who looked at the small orb in his hand before he dismissed it. That certainly was odd. Still, I can't argue with the results, it proves that we humans still possess magicka, so let's head home, it's getting late. Ayla nodded and they left for Naruto's apartment complex. That night when they returned, Naruto introduced Ayla to Zabuza and Haku. The ice user was cautious around the hunter of Hurchini, as Naruto informed them all that he knew about the Daedric gods and goddesses, as well as the old gods and goddesses, but after a few minutes of talking before they bid each other good night, Haku and Ayla found themselves getting along rather well. Ayla was definitely impressed by the sword wielded by Zabuza. She commented that even Farkas and Vilkas would have a difficult time wilding such a massive blade, making Zabuza chuckle. The four then went to bed in their own rooms and for the first time in ten millennia, Ayla had found herself sleeping soundly. A week before the finals, Naruto woke up and walked out of his room and towards his kitchen when he saw Ayla staring at a small sake jug. Upon hearing him enter, Ayla turned to him. Naruto. What is this drink? Naruto blinked, it's sake an alcoholic drink made from fermented rice. It is a drink either served warm, or served cold. Ayla lifted a small sake saucer. Is this the cup for it? Why is it so small? Naruto chuckled. From what I know, as I've never had sake myself, it is a very potent drink. Ayla nodded and poured herself some of the sake into the small saucer, before she drank it in one go before shuddering slightly. It tastes odd. It is somewhat dry. Strange. A. N. This is a sort of renactment of my first experience with sake. To me, that stuff tastes like liquid chalk, dry and bland. Naruto raised an eyebrow but shrugged. Whatever, so what are you planning to? Suddenly a puff of smoke appeared on the table, making Ayla draw her iron dagger and Naruto to prepare to fight when the smoke cleared suddenly, to reveal. A small reptile-like creature with four horns pointed backwards on the sides of its head. It was about the size of a small dog. Its scales were gray in color, with small front legs and powerful looking, for their size, hind legs and a long, narrow tail about two feet long with three black spikes in the form of a trident at the tip. The creature swerved its triangular head around and looked at the two humans, before speaking in an obviously male voice. Forgive my intrusion. I am searching for someone. Naruto and Ayla looked at each other in confusion before looking back at the creature. Who are you looking for? The creature tilted his head as he focused on Naruto. I am seeking a Naruto. They are supposed to be one of the few remaining members of the Uzumaki clan in the elemental nations. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Um, I am Naruto Uzumaki. 
The reptile lifted his head and narrowed his eyes. I find that difficult to believe. The Uzumaki clan were known for their red hair and violet eyes. You possess neither of these traits. Naruto shrugged. That's the name I was given. I'm an orphan, so I don't know my parents. Maybe one of them was an Uzumaki and I just take from the other parent. The reptile narrowed his eyes. Hold out your hand. I will use Uzumaki Fuenjutsu to see if you are Uzumaki or not. Naruto looked at Ayla, who shrugged in confusion, and he turned back to the reptile and held out his hand. Suddenly the creature's head shot forward and bit his hand for a moment before pulling back, his teeth bloody. Naruto jerked his hand back and grasped it. Damn it. The reptile then leaned its head at an angle and some blood fell onto a seal on a scroll it had on its back. The seal glowed and a spiral began to form and fill with a silver coloration. However, only half of it filled in making the reptile nod. It seems you are indeed an Uzumaki, at least half. Very well, I, Suigen, scroll bearer of the Hydra clan of Uzushiogakur, offer you the Hydra summoning contract, it is your birthright as a member of the Uzumaki clan's royal family. Naruto and Ayla blinked in shock. Royal family? Naruto was royalty. The creature, now identified as a Hydra, tapped the half-colored spiral seal. The color of this seal identifies which portion of the Uzumaki family an individual is. Red is civilian and average families of the Uzumaki clan. Orange is a member or a descendant of a member of the Council of Uzu. Gray is a member or descendant of a member of the guardian branch of the clan, and silver is of the royal family. Naruto and Ayla nodded, still more than a little shocked at the revelation. Suddenly Zabuza walked into the room wearing only his pants and sandals, as usual. The hell? A Hydra? I thought that summon clan vanished with the Uzumaki clan. The Hydra turned and faced Zabuza. We did not vanish, we were just never summoned because the ones we approved were killed in battle. When we saw the names of every Uzumaki we allowed to sign the contract fade and darken, we realized someone was exterminating the Uzumaki clan. However, upon returning to the world, we began to seek out any potential survivors. That was when we heard rumor of the Uzumaki refugees in other countries, we decided to begin our search there. Some searches were a success, others ended in failure. However, Naruto here is the first to activate the silver pigmentation of this seal. Zabuza nodded and Haku soon entered the room. After her shock at seeing the small summon, and having the situation explained, she began to fix herself some breakfast along with Naruto, Zabuza, and Ayla. Suigen, after leaving the contract scroll and telling Naruto how to sign it, vanished in a puff of smoke. Naruto looked at the contract for a moment as he ate before shrugging and placed it in his pocket. He looked at the time and nodded. It was a quarter past seven. He had about 45 minutes until he had to meet Kamara. Naruto finished his meal quickly and stood up to go change. A few minutes later, he leapt out of the window of his room and began roof jumping towards his training field with Kamara. A few hours later, Naruto and Kamara had finished testing a combination attack and decided to rest a bit at the hot springs. Kamara, of course, teased Naruto by telling him not to peek while she was there, making the blonde blush and stutter out how he had more pride that. Kamara approved of that and winked at him as they went to the separate sides. However, as Naruto went into the changing room, he pulled the summoning contract from his pocket to contemplate it as he undressed and went out to the hot springs. He was lucky the contract was waterproof, since the Hydra summoning world was a massive river-filled valley it would need to be. As Naruto looked at the contract, he glanced at it and turned it in his hands to look it over. It was rather small, about the size of an average ceiling scroll. Suddenly he heard a strange giggling and looked over to see an old man with long white hair wearing a green attire under a red over jacket, with Geta sandals. He was squatting near the wall, and from the giggling sounds he was making, Naruto instantly guessed what he was doing and chucked the scroll without even thinking and nailed the back of his head, making the old man faceplant into the wall. This caused the wall to rattle, letting the occupants of the opposite side know someone was there as Naruto shouted. Hey you perv! Don't you have anything better to do? Get lost! The man turned around with an annoyed expression before an ivory spike pierced the wall near his head, making him go pale and Naruto laughed. Hey Kamara, you missed by a few inches. The perv is a little more to the right. The man paled even more and moved back as the spike shifted into a blade and sliced towards the man, with him barely dodging and Kamara scoffed in annoyance as the man ran away from the wall and closer to Naruto. Damn it, I almost got him too. 
Kamara, club. Suddenly the man was kicked in the back of the head by Naruto and sent forward as the ivory blade shifted again into a bone with an oversized joint end, and he faceplanted into the bone. Naruto chuckled. Nice work Kamara, not even near each other and we've got perfect teamwork. The man suddenly exploded in a puff of smoke, revealing a log, making Naruto groan in disappointment. Great, the perv is a shinobi. The bone retracted back to the women's side and Kamara, wrapped in a towel, moved away, revealing the women's side had been abandoned when the peeper had been announced. Naruto smirked before he looked and saw the summoning contract and smacked himself in the head. Why the hell did I throw that? Kami in the divine above I'm an idiot. Naruto walked up and when he picked up the scroll, the man walked up and snatched it. Hey, give that back, perv. The man ignored him and studied the scroll with a serious expression. Where the hell did a kid like you find a summoning scroll? Nartuo jumped up and snatched it. The summons gave it to me. Now scram you perverted old geezer. Suddenly the man bit his thumb, made a few hand signs, and slammed his hand onto the ground. An explosion of smoke made Naruto cover his eyes before he saw a giant toad sighting under the man as he posed on top of it. You little brat. Do you have any idea who I am? I am the sage of Mount Myoboku. A man of great power and wisdom. I am a man who makes women swoon. I am the gallant Jiraiya. The toad then croaked, somewhat ruining the moment as Naruto's sweat dropped. You're Jiraiya. Jeez pervy sage, you're kinda pathetic. Kamara suddenly started howling with laughter as she made her way around, now fully dressed and the man faceplanted, yet again. Suddenly he stood up and looked at Kamara before narrowing his eyes. I thought the Kagaya clan was wiped out. Kamara stopped smirking her her face went blank. Do not ever speak of those imbeciles, my old clan were nothing more than bigoted fools who believed they deserved to rule everything. Just because we were supposedly named after some mythological rabbit goddess, horned demon, or whatever it was. Jiraiya and Naruto raised an eyebrow. Kamara looked at them and shrugged. It's an old Kagaya clan myth. No one really knows how old it is, but supposedly, before the Rikudo Senin came about, there was a goddess with two horns. She was beautiful was powerful, but she was also cruel towards any disobedient subjects under her rule. Apparently the horns were a sign of the dead bone pulse Keke Jenke and that the clan I hail from were descended from this horned demon, Kagaya. Jiraiya took a contemplative stance and nodded. I've heard that before. It's not just the Kagaya clan, that myth was also in various places throughout the elemental nations, but those places were temples and ancient homes and libraries in various countries that kept records of old legends and stories as well as history of the elemental nations. Kamara and Naruto looked surprised before the sage looked at the two. So who are you two, anyways? Naruto raised an eyebrow. Naruto Uzumaki. This is Kamara, my partner for the final stage of the Chunin exams. Jiraiya raised an eyebrow and smirked. A squirt like you made it to the final round. I'm impressed. Naruto narrowed his eyes and took a deep breath, making Kamara cover her ears as Jiraiya looked amused. What are you gonna do? Shout at M, Fus. Suddenly Jiraiya was sent flying as Naruto used his unrelenting force shout on the poor, unsuspecting sage. Jiraiya landed on the opposite side of the hot spring about 20 feet away from where Naruto launched him. Naruto and Kamara smirked as they turned and left. Jiraiya sat up as he watched them leave. So, that's what Sensei was talking about. His voice is powerful, indeed. He stood up and looked to the sky, knowing Hiruzen was looking down at him from that old crystal ball of his. Back at the training grounds. Naruto had the scroll in his hand and looked at Kamara, who simply nodded. Naruto returned the nod and opened the scroll before it was enveloped in a puff of smoke and landed in the ground with a heavier thud than either of them expected from such a small scroll, only to go wide-eyed when the small scroll suddenly revealed itself as a massive scroll about a third of Naruto's height and a foot thick. Naruto blinked and rubbed his eyes before he unraveled the scroll to see dozens of names on the scroll, all but very few being of the Uzumaki clan. The last name before the blank space was someone by the name of Kayan Uzumaki. That name was still red while the one before as well as the rest were black, the first black name he saw was Kashina Uzumaki. Naruto didn't know why, but he felt a kinship with that name, even more than the other Uzumaki names. Naruto shook his head and looked at the blank space before biting his thumb and writing his name in the blank space before adding the prints of his fingertips under the name. 
Naruto watched as the blood-red writing seemed to dry and turn a dark maroon like the previous name. Naruto nodded and rilled the scroll up, and it shrank in the same manner it had grown in size. Naruto placed the scroll back into his pocket and bit his recently healed thumb and made the needed hand signs before slamming his hand on the ground, channeling as much chakra as he could into the jutsu. Kachiyose no jutsu. Suddenly a massive amount of smoke exploded around Naruto and Kamara and billowed into the air. As the smoke cleared, a massive, sapphire blue hydra with eight heads was revealed. It then spoke in a feminine tone. Who has summoned me? The hydra looked up and lowered the head that Kamara and Naruto stood on as the other seven looked at them. Which of you two summoned me? Naruto raised his hand. I did. I am Naruto Uzumaki. Suigen gave me the scroll to sign after he tested my blood on the seal. The seven heads narrowed their eyes and seemed to contemplate his words as they muttered to each other before the head underneath him spoke. Ah oh yes, I remember Suigen speaking of the heir of Uzu. So you are him? Interesting that a half-blooded Uzumaki would be of the royal family. Still, blood does not matter. What are your intentions for the Hydra clan? Naruto narrowed his eyes. I have no intent for you. Your kind may do as they please. If you do not wish to be contracted to me, tell me and I will allow you to remove my name. The Hydra looked at the blonde in surprise before Naruto continued. As for what I desire, I want to protect my precious people, and to do that I need to fulfill my destiny, they Hydra snorted. We do not believe in destiny. It is something for the weak to cling to, those unwilling to change their own fate. It is. I know, and I agree, but this is different. If I ignore this, the world will end. The great black dragon, Alduin has returned to devour the world. Kamara and the Hydra looked at him in confusion and shock. Alduin? I have only heard tales and legends of that monster since I was a hatchling. If he has returned, and it is your destiny to defeat him, then you must be the one known in legends as Dragonborn. Naruto nodded as the Hydra set the two down. I, Shikisu, head of the Hydra clan and daughter of the Grand Sage of the Hydra clan's home, the Forgotten Vale, Acknowledge you as our summoner. Naruto smiled brightly and looked at Kamara, who returned the smile, though hers was filled with confusion. So Naruto told her everything that had happened from the ruins and Tei awakening of the dragon, Alduin, and even meeting a few demon like gods known as Daedra. Kamara was in awe. All that happened to you? I'm impressed, but there's one thing I gotta ask. Magic? Really? Naruto smirked and held up his hand showing signs of the conjuration spell before he clenched his fist making the small sphere in his hand seem to contract and glow a bit more before he pointed his hand out and a daedric portal appeared before Fiera appeared. Upon noticing him, the flame Atronach queen levitated behind him and hugged him from behind, and smiled as she rubbed her cheek against Naruto's cheek. Hello master, it is so good to see you again. Naruto chuckled awkwardly as he looked at Kamara. Well, as you can see, magic does exist. Kamara, this is Fiera, Queen of the Flame Atronox and Flame Thralls. Fiera, this is Kamara, my partner for the final round of the Chunin exams. Fiera tilted her head. Chunin exams. My kind has not been in Skyrim or Tamriel for ten millennia, so much has changed without us knowing. Naruto nodded and began explaining the shinobi, their duties, and their rankings within the villages. Fiera was interested in the changes the world had come to and nodded. However, she was disappointed to hear the last remaining spell tomes were either in too poor condition to be used or locked away as relics of the past. She mentally decided to seek out Hermias Mora's seekers and request they bring spell tomes back to the lands in hidden locations so only those worthy could use them, after all, the Atronachs deserved to see the world once again. She bowed towards Naruto and Kamara, commenting on how they made a cute couple, much to their embarrassment before she dismissed herself and faded from existence. Naruto and Kamara sighed before looking at each other. Well, the Chunin exams are in a week, are you feeling ready, Kamara? Kamara smirked and nodded as they left the training grounds to get dinner since it was getting late. Day of the Chunin exam finals. The village was bustling with energy as the hour for the Chunin exams final round drew nearer. The arena was already filling up and most of the shinobi were in the center with the proctor, Genma, Hayate having been attacked during the month intermission. Though, Luckily he had managed to survive, he had fallen unconscious and wasn't supposed to awaken for about a month due to the injuries and blood loss. Lathan, Louis, Neji, Gara, Kiba, Yoroi, Yugito, Hanada, Zaku, 
Kin, Shikamaru, Choji, Shino, Sakura, Samui, Konkuro, Ino, Masumi, and Kamara were standing in a line in the center of the arena, though Dosu seemed to be missing so the extra spot that was to be filled by the extra shinobi, Shikamaru, who would have fought with a random team. Sakura and Kamara were looking around for two specific people. Sakura looked around for Sasuke and Kamara looked around for Naruto. Genma looked at the group and sighed as he held his senbon between his teeth. All right, I'm the proctor for this round. Hayate's illness grew worse so he had to sit this one out. Now, here is the schedule for the fight today. Pay attention as there will not be any changes made to it unless all of the cage agree to the changes. Tier 1 Match 1. Karui, Tenten vs. Lathan, Neji Match 2. Yugito, Hanada vs. Shino, Sakura. Match 3. Zaku, Kin vs. Gara. Lewis Match 4. Kiba, Yoroi vs. Sasuke, Tamari. Match 5. Kamara, Naruto vs. Samui, Konkuro Match 6. Shikamaru, Choji vs. Ino, Masumi. Tier 2 Match 1. Winning Team of Match 1 vs. Winning Team of Match 2. Match 2. Winning Team of Match 3 vs. Winning Team of Match 4. Match 3. Winning Team of Match 6 vs. Winning Team of Match 6. Tier 3 Match 1. Battle Royale, no more assigned teams, no rules except no killing and obey the proctor. Kamara sighed as she realized Naruto still had time to get here when suddenly Naruto leapt from above the stands to the wall above them and then down to the ground of the arena. Sorry I was late, on the way here I realized that I forgot something important so I had to go back and get it. Genma smirked. It's fine kid, you made it just in time and besides, your match isn't first so you would have been fine if you arrived a few minutes late. Naruto sighed and nodded before standing next to Kamara, returning the smile she sent him. Genma looked around for a few minutes before Hiruzen stood up and walked forward, the case cage, Mizukage, and the Reikage remained seated as was customary for the Chunin exams, since Konoha was the host for it, the Hokage was the one to announce the start of it. The Reikage, A, was actually surprised at the idea the Hokage had. A two on two tournament had never been done before. So this was sure to be interesting. The K's cage was silent as he watched on from his seat, a veil covering the lower half of his face as he used the excuse of a minor sickness to keep it on. As the Hokage announced the start of the final round, I glanced out of the corner of his eye towards the Yandaimi K's cage. Something was off about the man, but he couldn't place his finger on it. As cheers erupted from the crowd, he turned his attention on the four now remaining in the arena. One of his own paired with a Konoha Kunoichi as they faced off against another Konoha Nin and a Kiri Nin. He smirked in interest as Genma started the match. The first match, Karui of Kumo and Tenten of Konoha versus Lathan of Kiri and Neji of Konoha, begin, and Genma leapt out of the arena so he wouldn't get in the way. Tenten pulled out a small scroll and unraveled it, releasing a Wakazashi with a black hilt. Tenten looked over at her teammate for the finals, who returned the look. The two nodded as they took a stance each as they waited. Neji simply took his typical Jiyukan stance while Lathan drew his oddly glowing swords and held them in a wide, yet low stance, one held over his head and the other held out in front of him, his arms curled outwards. Neji narrowed his eyes as his Byakugan activated. You two should just forfeit, fate is against you today. Lathan and Karui looked at Neji oddly while Tenten simply remained silent. Lathan scoffed. Please. Fate has no part in this competition. Neji looked at him. It is foolish to believe fate has no power in every action we do. Fate determines how strong or how weak an individual is. Fate decrees me is the strongest and fate is written in stone. Lathan had a deadpan expression before he stabbed a rock with his demonic looking sword. The sword easily pierced through the rock. Stone can be broken, just like someone's supposed fate. Neji narrowed his eyes. Foolish. Fate is unavoidable. It has decreed our victory, my vict. Oh shut the hell up. Oh shut the hell up. Lathan and Neji look at Tenten and Karui in surprise. The two Kunoichi were seething at Neji's fate speech so they decided to start and charged at Neji, ignoring Lathan entirely as Neji began ducking and weaving around strikes. Tenten scowled. I am sick and tired of your fate bullshit. When will you realize that you're just using excuses to make yourself feel better? Neji seed, how dare this clanless nobody tell him off. Same team or not, she would learn to respect her betters. 
Neji suddenly started spinning and released a large amount of chakra that spun with him, forming a sphere that knocked Karui and Tenten away, their swords flying from their grip. Katen. In the stands, Hiyashi was in shock, along with several other members of the Hyuga main family. Hiyashi narrowed his eyes in thought. How could a branch member learn a main family technique? Did he learn it on his own? If so, his skills truly are those of a prodigy worthy of the main family. Back on the field, Karui sat up, her eyes wide. What the hell was that? Tenten stood up and narrowed her eyes. I've heard rumors of that technique, it's the ultimate defense for the Hyuga clan, nothing can get through it. Karui looked surprised as did Lathan, but Lathan shook his head and gripped his swords tighter before charging forward, hoping to catch at least one of his opponents off guard. Tenten noticed him, however, and drew a scroll which she unraveled, releasing a swarm of eight-point shuriken that made a rather large wall between Lathan and the two Kunoichi. However, Lathan simply smirked and stopped before sheathing the demonic sword and focusing his chakra into his golden sword which he gripped in two hands. Do you think that'll stop me? My blade has a unique trick, if I channel my chakra through it, I can do this. Suddenly he flipped the sword and stabbed it into the ground, causing an explosion of light and fire. A N. Similar to the Vampire's Bane spell from the Dawnguard DLC, the blast met the wall of shuriken and the shuriken lost as they were blown out in random directions. Tenten unsealed a pair of nunchaku and began deflecting the shuriken alongside Karui, who had taken the time to retrieve her sword. Neji charged forward and slid into a stance in front of Karui. Hake Rokuhuin show. Suddenly Neji blurred forward and began to jab his fingertips at Karui closing her tenkatsu and dealing massive amounts of pain at the same time. He smirked as he finished the technique and jumped back to dodge a blow from Tenten who helped Karui stand. Tenten held out her hand, which had a food pill. Karui looked at Tenten and nodded before she took it and ate it. Ah, that tastes awful. Tenten sighed, but at least it works, now get up. Just because you can't use chakra doesn't mean you can't fight. My teammate is the best example of that. Karui nodded before she smirked. Hey, at least that means that Prick's fancy pokes aren't useful anymore. I don't need chakra to use my kenjutsu. I was taught by a master of kenjutsu, so I can't disappoint him here. Tenten smirked and nodded as the two stood up straight and Tenten unsealed a regular katana before she took a stance mirroring Karui's newest stance. Karui and Tenten smirked before they charged forward, crossing paths occasionally before separating and leaping into the air. Neji and Lathan looked up but due to the position of the sun and the height that Tenten and Karui had leapt, they were unable to see. Or at least Neji was unable to see. Lathan simply smirked as he held out his left hand, which had a small light in it. He twitched his hand and opened it, palm towards the sky, as a ball of light shot out and hit Tenten, who was above him and knocked her back, and into Karui. Lathan smirked. Sorry girls. But sunlight is the ally of the champion of Meridia. You can't use it against me. Only a champion of Akatashi could use the sun against me. Tenten staggered her way to her feet and looked at Karui before she was attacked by Neji. Neji quickly struck at her tenketsu and then hit the back of her neck, rendering her unconscious. Karui looked up as Tenten fell before she stood up as Neji glared at her. Akumo Kunoichi. A member of the village that killed his father. Neji swore he would have revenge on the village, and what better way than to kill one of their candidates for the Chunin exam. Neji smirked darkly as he raised his palm, ready to throw a killing blow. Lathan saw this as did Genma and they tried to stop him. Wold. Suddenly a figure dropped in front of Neji, causing him to stop. Naruto was standing there, before him, making Neji look surprised. There was no chakra for whatever technique he used. Was it a pure speed technique? No, it was something else. It matters not. He is the dead last of his year. So he too will fall to me. Lathan, however, was wide-eyed. T that was a Thuam. Meridia, did you know a Dovakan was here? He wasn't actually expecting the Daedric Lord to respond, so he jumped a bit at the voice of the Daedric Lord of Light. No, my champion. I was unaware of the Dovakan. Though it appears my fellow Daedra are, I sense Azora's blessing, as well as Sheagorath's artifact. It also appears Nocturnal has taken an interest, but she is keeping her distance, as I would expect. She was never one to casually approach a mortal, lest she had properly prepared for the meeting. I would advise not gaining his wrath. Lathan mentally nodded to the Daedric Lord's words. If this kid was the Dovican, 
then he sure as hell wasn't going to become enemies with him, he was essentially the champion of Akatosh in all but title. The winners of the first match are Lathan of Kiri and Neji of Konoha. Neji Hayuga, step away from your opponents. You already won, so get back up to the stands so you can rest up for the next round. Neji scoffed and walked away, making Naruto growl deeply, startling Karui, Tenten, Lathan, and Genma at how inhuman the growl was. Naruto turned and looked at Tenten and Karui. Sorry for getting involved. I know you didn't need it, but that Teme looked like a guy out for blood, especially yours, Karui. Karui nodded, slightly shaken at the blood she had seen in Neji's eyes. Naruto nodded and watched as the two stood up shakily as two pairs of medical shinobi came onto the field and helped them off the field to the medical wing of the stadium. Naruto ran towards the competitor's booth and leapt up, landing on the rail at the edge of the viewing platform and hopping in next to Kamara, who smirked. Just had to show off, didn't you? Naruto gave her an innocent look. Whatever do you mean? Kamara just laughed and gave his arm a light punch. Genma spoke up, his voice echoing around the stadium thanks to seals embedded in the walls. Will Hanada Hayuga, Yugito Ni, Shino Abarame, and Sakura Haruno please come down to the field? You have five minutes before the start of the match. Shino walked down the stairs along with Hanada and Sakura. Yugito, however, leapt off the edge and landed on the ground several meters below. She smirked and walked over to her spot slowly. In the stairway, Shino and Hanada walked in silence. Sakura, however, was screeching about how she missed Sasuke. Shino mentally sighed, he was highly unlikely to win this fight, Sakura refused to train with him, in fact if he was correct, she did not train at all during the month-long gap between today and the end of the second exam. Hanada was nervous about the upcoming fight, but she wouldn't hold back. Despite being from Kumo, Yugito was helpful in boosting the timid Hayuga's confidence, even if only a bit. Hanada was also surprised that Kumo wasn't interested in obtaining the Byakugan anymore. Apparently, that was a plot devised by the Sandame Reikage Civilian Council, filled with civilians who agreed with his ideals. They plotted the kidnapping behind the Yandaimi's back to try and bring the heiress to the village and use her as a breeder for future Kumo Byakugan users. Of course, once had discovered this, he immediately returned the body of the Hayuga, who he demanded for the death of his subordinate and swore to the Sandame to right the wrongs of his predecessor and he soon removed the civilian council and replaced them with a representative, changing the council system of Kumo to a council representatives, cage, shinobi, civilian, advisor, and elder. Of course, Hanada had asked why Yugito was telling her all of this. Yugito explained that it was her own personal way of making amends for Kumo's crime towards the Hyuga clan, letting her know that nothing like that would ever come about again while the Yandaimi Reikage was in charge of Kumo. Soon Hanada and Yugito bonded and became friends, which was what brought Hanada out of her shell slightly. Hanada shook herself from her thoughts and tried to collect herself. She would be fighting alongside Yugito, and while Shino would be difficult to fight against, Sakura would be easily dealt with due to her simple-mindedness. Hanada looked at Shino, who returned the glance and nodded. Good luck, Hanada. Please do your best, it will be interesting to see if you have gotten stronger over the course of the month. Hanada smiled softly, though he was awkward with his wording, Hanada knew he was trying to relax her by saying there would be no hard feeling no matter who won or lost the match. Hanada nodded. Good luck to you as well, Shino. Sakura looked over and frowned. Why are you wishing Hanada luck? She's our enemy in this. Shino sighed. She is just a competitor, not an enemy. Perhaps if your mind went beyond the Uchiha, you could comprehend this simple fact. Hanada tuned out Sakura's response, a remarkable accomplishment considering the Pinket was now screeching at Shino in a voice almost loud enough to be heard from the field. Within two minutes, the trio managed to make their way to the center of the field, paired up and ready to fight. Genma looked at the two sides. Ready. Begin. Genma moved back as Shino began releasing his kakaichu, making Sakura freak out a bit at the sight of the swarm of small beetles rising from Shino's sleeves. Hanada activated her Byakugan and took the traditional Jiyukan stance, but she did something no one but Yugito expected, she began to lightly sway in place. Shino raised an eyebrow and he narrowed his eyes behind his sunglasses. Hum, it seems Hanada has learned a new style, or to be more accurate, she has modified the traditional Jiyukan. Good, it was clear that the style was not entirely suited for her. 
Shino smiled very slightly behind the collar of his jacket and looked at Yugito who smirked and crouched into a stance similar to the Inazuka clan stance, but he noticed that Yugito's body flexed and bent in a way that even an Inazuka couldn't, making her stances similar to that of a cat rather than a dog. Could she be from a clan that takes after cats, like the Inazuka takes after dogs? I will need to watch carefully and see. All of these thoughts and action happened within mere seconds of Genma starting the fight. Soon after, Yugito rushed forward, keeping low to the ground as Shino swung his arms, sending his Kakaichu swarm towards her to test her capabilities. Hanada charged forward and moved around Yugito towards Sakura who got into a rough stance of the Academy Taijutsu style. Hanada and many others could easily tell that she had obviously not practiced, which was why, with a single hit from Hanada, Sakura was sent flying back and knocked unconscious. Hanada frowned as she stared at her outstretched fist. She felt slight disappointment that she didn't get to truly test herself against the one who would attack Naruto for even the nicest of compliments, as if he were a waste of space. Hanada mentally shook her head, knowing Sakura was the waste of space, not Naruto. She looked and saw Shino dodging around Yugito. Yugito was now launching fire jutsu at Shino making him sweat before he pulled out a kanai and did something very few Abirame had done before. He charged towards Yugito, much to her surprise and engaged her in close combat. Yugito was surprised at the skill he used with the kanai, better than the average chunin but not as good as a seasoned chunin. Yugito smirked and drew her own kanai to help defend against Shino's, she would use her claws, but she didn't want to use Nibi's chakra just yet, she'd rather save that for the fight against Naruto. She somehow knew she would need it for that match. That boy seemed to radiate power, power greater than anything even Matabi could remember with her centuries of existence. I heard that, Yugi-chan. Yugito mentally smirked at her partner Biju's words. Matabi was like some civilian women and even a few civilian men, she did not like being reminded about her age. Yugi-chan. I can still hear you. Yugito giggled a bit making Shino raise an eyebrow. Yugito noticed this and smirked. This is a fun fight, but I think we should end it quickly. Don't want to drag these fights on too long. Shino looked at Yugito. Eyebrow still raised before his other eyebrow rose as well in shock as Yugito gathered a large amount of chakra. Shino looked surprised for a moment as a Kakaichi flew to his collar and landed. Then he smirked much to Yugito's confusion before she was suddenly surrounded by an enormous swarm of Shino's Kakaichu. However, she noticed that rather than the small, black beetles, these were slightly larger, and had patches of red coloration on their black bodies. The insects clung to her and hung in the air around her as they began draining the chakra she was gathering, preventing her from using her jutsu. Yugito was in shock, there were enough that they were able to prevent her from using jutsu? How is this possible? As far as I'm aware, my chakra should be toxic to these insects. Shino smirked under his collar. So I was correct in my assumption. My Kakaichu told me her chakra was similar to Naruto's. It is a good thing I bred these over the month long break. Though I am still surprised how quickly they reproduced, it is a massive benefit for me in this fight, and possibly in a fight against Naruto. Yugito jumped back and suddenly released as much chakra as she could as quickly as she could. The resulting burst sent the insects flying off of her, which allowed her to dodge and roll away before they could cling to her again, but now she was running low on her human chakra reserves. Damn, those things must have been starved of chakra to eat that much in such a short period of time. Perhaps that was his plan. Or maybe they can't eat anything but biju chakra. Biju chakra is denser than normal chakra, so normal chakra wouldn't be filling for them if that were the case. They would need to drain over a dozen Janin Shinobi dry to get the equivalent of three minutes of draining a Jinchuriki's chakra. Yugito jumped back as more of these Kakaichu swarmed towards her to try and surround her again. She noticed Shino walking casually towards her as he directed the swarm with casual waves of his hands. I believe you have figured out why these Kakaichu are able to siphon off your chakra, despite its toxic nature. I originally bred these over the month to help against Naruto, whose chakra is, oddly enough, toxic to my clan's basic kakaichu. I was surprised when my kakaichu told me just moments ago that your chakra had a similar toxicity to it. So I had no choice but to reveal my ace for Naruto, here in this fight. Though I do wonder why Akumo Kunoichi has such similar chakra to one of my comrades, distant relatives, or is it something else? Hanada leapt forward from behind Shino, 
making him jump to the side as Hanada left an indent on the ground from her impact. Hanada looked at Shino as Yugito mentally swore at the intelligence the Abarame displayed at nearly pointing out her and Naruto being Jinchuriki. You know, that's the most I've ever heard you speak in one go, Shino. Shino smiled. And that is the first time I have heard you speak without a single stutter. It seems teaming up with this Kumo Kunoichi has done wonders for your self esteem. Hinata smiled shyly and nodded before focusing and striking at him again. Shino mentally commanded his unique swarm to continue hunting Yugito, while giving them somewhat vague commands to make them more unpredictable. Meanwhile, Shino pulled out his kanai again and began dodging Hinata's strikes while attempting to counter attack. In the stands, Hiyashi was surprised. Hinata was actually going on the offensive. However, something disturbed him. The moves she made were familiar, but unfamiliar at the same time. He recognized the Jiyukan base for the style but the way she seemed to constantly move was unlike anything he'd ever seen in a Hyuga. Did she modify the Jiyukan? Meanwhile several of the Hyuga elders narrowed their eyes. Back in the arena. Hanada twisted out of the way as Shino thrust his kanai at her. She was getting tired. Though her spars and the training with Yugito helped her endurance, she still wasn't able to last in a prolonged fight. Shino knew this as well but he couldn't capitalize on this as he too suffered from the same flaw. He looked over at Yugito who had frightened off his swarm with a swarm of what appeared to be mice made of fire that chased the swarm around. Shino frowned. This match was going south for him rather quickly now. Yugito seemed to have a specialty in fire jutsu, if this unusual fire mouse jutsu was anything to go by but it did confirm a slight suspicion on her fighting style being oriented to felines. It was like she was obsessed with cats. Yugito turned as the swarms rushed back to Shino and made their way into his sleeves and into special pouches near the shoulders of his coat since the insects were too dangerous to keep in his body. To keep them fed he had gone to the Akamichi clan and requested they make him a set of special chakra pills that the Kakaichu could feed on in place of his chakra. Shuza and Shikaku themselves put their effort into making an efficient pill as they knew exactly what type of chakra the insects ate after hearing how and why Shino bred them. Shino ducked and dodged around Hanada's chakra coated palm, then he noticed that the chakra was starting to expand around her palms, though it seemed she didn't notice herself. Suddenly, Shino went rigid. He turned and saw Yugito standing there, a kanai placed at his spine and Hanada placed her hand at his, chakra flowing but not being injected into him. Shino sighed and placed his kanai back into his kanai pouch before lifting a single arm. I forfeit. I am outmatched and even my new hive is unable to defeat my opponents. Genma stepped back onto the arena floor and walked forward. Alright, the winners of this match are Hanada Hayuga and Yugito Ni. Hanada looked up as the crowd started cheering. Yugito smiled and held her fist up in victory and smiled at Hanada who returned to her shy demeanor now that she wasn't focusing on the fight and blushed at the praise from the crowd she was receiving along with Yugito. Hanada looked up at the competitor's booth and saw Naruto smiling and giving her and Yugito a thumbs up, making her smile a bit brighter, along with her blush. She felt like she could fly right now as she shyly waved at the crowd while making her way to the competitor's booth again while Genma stood in the center of the arena. Alright, it is time for the third match of the first round. Will Zaku, Kin, Gara? And Lewis, please come down to the field so we can start the next match. The crowd roared in approval, eager to see another exciting match. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.